sides uh, of one coin, one. So far, we have tried to document uh, the benefits of our membership by through money, whether we are a net contributor or beneficiary, and what can we pay, and what can we build from the EU money. But I don't think this works well. It underestimates the, uh, the IQ of people. It's like we would think them as of reptiles, uh, like uh, that they should work uh, on uh, on this uh, kind of a reptile brain and uh, on the level of instincts uh, and uh, we are we have been overlooking uh, the internal problems and kinds of corruption etc and then uh, the second thing, we are not able to benefit from the free movement of citizens. Now we, there is a huge brain drain in Slovakia. We are losing the best quality people because they are living for better conditions and we cannot uh, kind of bring them back. The free movement of citizens is a huge benefit of the European uh, uh, integration, but uh, and w if we cannot make use of its potential, then it becomes really um, harmful to us, and that's what's happening to us. The policy of our governments, including the governments that were talking about the fact that Slovakia is not only Bratislava to a large extent, because uh, actually. It, it actually brings Slovakia to the periphery of the EU, and this can be seen in the attitude of the public to the EU. And I could stop here, and I, yet again I could be labeled as pessimist, but I will mention three areas where we could look for uh, change of narrative, uh, green uh, reform than democracy and monetary union that say it stabilizes uh, the EU that uh, closes the gap among the states and the protection of the rule of uh, law. The European Union needs European tools for protecting the rule of uh, law, which is very important, especially for small members. This is great. We have got a wonderful Di wonderfully diverse perspectives on the Slovak foreign and European policy. And I'll ask you a couple of questions. And uh, then uh, please uh, ask your questions. I've got uh, a couple of questions via Slido already. You can't see them yet, but I hope this will change. Martin. You opened uh, your speech by saying that DCA has been on table for past weeks as if it was a question of life and death, and we neglect vital questions. I was also very uh, surprised that uh, our foreign policy consensus could be so distinct stabilized uh, through this topic and I thought that uh, we are far uh, that we have we have overcome that uh, a long time and rather you have mentioned that we are getting to the periphery of the European Union so the skeptical attitude uh, you usually were mentioning this is an unprecedented challenge for our Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. The European Affairs are have become really hot topic and since we are going to listen to the Prime Minister after this panel, I will um, kind of phrase my question as follows. This cannot only be the question for the Ministry of uh, Foreign and Policy, uh, European Affairs. This is a a task for all state institutions or for our parliament, etc. And but it keeps on, you know, kind of the the the, wor the rumor is, or some say that well, this is question 
uh, for the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. Uh, the government office is uh, talking about the uh, recovery and resilience plan, but if diplomats are supposed to mm, go on the roadshow, well, diplomats are no showmen and show women, uh, and it's uh, not about diplomats talking to 100 people and thinking that uh, they are speaking to the whole country. I I think this could be only an add-on activity. We need a much broader alliance uh, when we want to speak about those topics. And where is the recovery and resilience plan? Are we becoming more resilient? Have we recovered already? It has been on the table for quite some time, and I don't know as somebody who follows the development, because the plan is something that needs to have certain parameters, certain checkpoints, etc. What we have managed to do with the recovery and resilience plan, uh, where, um, what do you think is good, uh, what do you see positively in this big project, uh, where are the positive things and impact of the recovery and resilience plan, we are getting money, um, now for the digitalization, innovations, etc. Okay, what are the positive impacts of the uh, recovery and resilience plans? Uh, well, the roadshow has uh, showed us that our diplomats can do both road and show, and I would like to thank them very much for that. And I think. Um, it was of interest to our citizens. It was not like uh, we haven't had uh, hundreds and thousands of people, but uh, definitely it was a lesson to be learned. Uh, uh, f yeah, and this was also a great experience, like how people perceive those uh, topics. And uh, my and uh, the finding is that the European topics uh, are not sexy. Uh, it's much more interesting to label somebody as uh, a traitor or from uh, treason, but if the European Bank Union comes on the table and uh, most of the people don't understand what it is about, and if we talk about the green transition, even though some have vague idea, but still they have totally different notions and the understanding of this topic and that they def people definitely don't connect it to the recovery and resilience plan or the EU and we f are failing yeah. and uh, uh, you were very right that many who should talk about these topics including the Slovak uh, members of the parliament uh, don't um, internalize those topics. And I also need to criticize myself. When I was a member of the Slovak National uh, Council, we really didn't pay uh, enough attention to those topics, uh, maybe sometimes somewhere up to 70 percent. And, and then another problem, if we achieve something positive and we get extra EU money, we actually had not um, thought would uh, do. Uh, like back uh, in 2020, though, during those four days and four nights, then there is this process that should use this money for the benefit of the citizens, then the process is really clumsy. So there is no golden bullet, there is no simple question, uh, answer to your question, uh, to your answer, restructuring of healthcare system, judiciary reform, uh, well, the, there are certain review, that we have already gone through review uh, process, part of it at least, or reform of the educational system, and uh, me as an the representative of academia, I am very much uh, interested in those in this topic but still we are on the way and then there are other topics that are totally not as uh, discussed as it they should be like digitalization and green economy transition and digitalization is a really a bitter bitter um 
topic because so much money has been wasted, unlike in Estonia. Estonia was great, and uh, it, it is a positive example. Unfortunately, we wasted so much money. And the second problematic area is digital transition and transformation. There is not uh, agreement or a single position uh, in the government or in the society, because we know that some decisions that need to be done when it comes to green transition are going to be tough. And I'm not really sure whether the current political representation in Slovakia is willing and ready to make those. Uh, it will need to get most probably stronger mandate from the citizens in the next. Uh, uh, Miriam, at the moment, the the pressure, the tension that we see after the the challenge that Russia basically posed to the, the whole West, because Ukraine is a part of the larger game that. Uh, that Russia is, you know, playing, uh, challenging the whole, you know, Western security system. You, sitting in the e European Parliament, f uh, watching the representatives of the EU or from Brussels or the respective leaders of the countries, member states, that are trying to communicate with Putin and the Russian diplomats and to negotiate with them, where do you see the strengths and weaknesses of the European foreign policy or is there anything like that? Because a number of people cast doubt upon this, that the Russian Federation now wants to negotiate with uh, the United States and they wants to negotiate with a few selected member states, but it seems it is not really uh, negotiating with the EU as such. The EU seems to be a side, or some people say that. So what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of something we call the European foreign policy? Thank you. That's a difficult one. Uh, the weaknesses are basically, I've already mentioned in my first opening speech, you know, our foreign policy hasn't been following s principles and values for many years. It wasn't based on these values where on which it was supposed to be based, and uh, we were closing our eyes from that for many years. For many years, our foreign, foreign policy wasn't unified, it wasn't single. And yes, foreign policy still, to a great degree, or to a major part, is in the, you know, is, 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 is led and, and conducted by the member states individually, not together. And it is sad that we haven't realized until now that in the geopolitical global world, we need to have a single voice, we need to uh, have shared interests, you know, our partial interests as member states, maybe the larger member states that historically played more important or leading roles, the partial interests of these countries are becoming tiny in this large global game which is being played at the moment on the globe, on the planet Earth. And the fact that we, we, we've been closing our eyes for many years mm, uh, in terms of our policy against Russia, how it divides us, and we were closing our eyes on, uh, you know, our attempts to cooperate economically with these countries for profits, and our belief that we will change Russia and other countries to be democratic with this cooperation, and the fact that we were closing our eyes that just to follow some partial economic benefits, uh, letting corrupted money into our territory that started to spread corruption. Also here, they were corroding our values. They were corroding the truth. And our th these are the failures that are turning out and disabling us to stand up against the situation. You know, since 2014, there was a conflict between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, or, you know, the attack of U on Ukraine. It was in 2014. And so far, we haven't stood up in principle as a single voice against the fact that even the member states of the EU and Russian Federation too were supposed to guarantee territorial integrity of Ukraine. We didn't stand up to the fact that this uh, treaty is not fulfilled. And these are the results now. We are reaping the benefits. And this disunity is also demonstrated by some leaders of the EU and some uh, Heads of the governments are trying to enter the negotiations, but I don't think it is, um, it is 
you know, uh, resulting in any great accomplishments. I think it's essential, absolutely essential and vital to understand that this is our mutual interest, but not only the interest of the EU, but it's the interest of the values that we represent. It's the interest of of the values is, is, is for the interests of, of people of the independent countries to decide where their country is supposed to be heading. So any country can decide where it wants to belong, so, so that a country can decide with whom it wants to cooperate. And these are the essential values that we need to protect also for our own benefits and for our own good. So these are, sorry, these are the weaknesses, right? Can you think of at least a single strength Because, you know, then we will talk with Rado, who is a pessimist, who is known for, for being a pessimist. So, sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want to be a hindrance, but maybe some strengths. I have a strength. Okay, Martin, the State Secretary. I believe that EU, the EU showed its strength also in the vaccination. For the, from the start, it was, you know, it was a bit com complicated. It was a bumpy road, but I want to return to that. But let's think about how we, the importance of the role we played as a global donor. But you will link this to Sputnik, right? But I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the uh, shared foreign policy, not about vaccination. Yeah, okay, the shared foreign policy shows that we can somehow agree and integrate our policies into one. Then it's for the benefit of uh, not only the EU citizens, but it has a global impact. And we... Even in Slovakia, we donate, we've donated a large number of vaccines. I even have a list of countries where, where our vaccines were directed, even though it was m many times because our citizens were not interested in getting vaccinated. But still, nevertheless, this showed the strength of the EU more than any other global players. And the difference between us and, uh, for example, China or Russia, if we, you mentioning, uh, you know, Sinopharma or Sputnik, is the fact that we did not abuse the vaccines as our global weapon, so to say. Maybe we should have done, but we didn't do that. Uh, Miriam, do you have an idea? Yes, that's right. It's rather a trend than a, a strength, but I want to mention that after many years, we've managed to approve the uh, European version of Magnitsky Act. So in principle, the protection of uh, human rights abroad, which often are, you know, undermined but as a result of our indirect result of our cooperation with uh, uh, third countries and uh, I'd like to thank Minister Korczak, Minister of uh, Slovak Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, that corruption becomes one of the reasons for sanctions within the scope of this European version of Magnitsky Act and other things are potential still but I'm very happy that we are working on it. The first is the Anti-Corrosion Act, uh, a legal piece of legislation which is supposed to protect our single market from the negative uh, third-party influences and due diligence, which is supposed to protect our retail chains so that uh, there are no products um, in our market which are manufactured uh, as a result of a gross uh, breach of human rights or child labor, etc., etc. So I believe this trend, if we follow it, will help us return back to our values. Uh, Radovan, you mentioned that European Union is going through a, a series of crises, you know, and it always somehow overcomes it, etc., etc. And many people who follow the development of the EU say that every single crisis somehow strengthens the EU in the end. Are you convinced that the, the corona crisis and now the Russian challenge will strengthen the European Union? Well, I wouldn't certainly agree that every crisis strengthens the EU. I think every crisis that you are able to manage may strengthen you because it prepares you for managing of the future similar crisis. I believe that the corona crisis has strengthened the EU, however, but it undermined what is essential for its operation, that stability of the member states inside, internally. Because even though it strengthened the EU, well, if I was a German, I could be thinking whether it wouldn't be better for my country, f you know, uh, for, you know, uh, pr procuring the vaccines for itself. If being a Slovak, I have no doubt that it would be much worse. It also, we've uh, broken the long-term taboo that European budget cannot be financed by a shared debt and that we cannot have a budget which is able to react to crises which have asymmetric influence or impact on the member states. 
And we still you know, keep hearing that this is just a one-off thing, but if it's going to be efficiently used, which depends on the member states, there's a great chance that this is going to happen and will become a part of the permanent solution. So, so from this perspective, it has the crisis has strengthened the European Union, or it at, at least opened new possibilities for it. And when it comes to security crisis, crisis, it's, a, it's an issue because of two reasons. The first reason is that the member states did not enter the crisis with the, the same or identical interests. And I'm not only talking about the relationship to Russia, but also the relationship to the United States. There are various ideas, etc., etc. In one thing where I see uh, the you know, positive thing or positive shift, and following up on uh, Miriam Lexman, the MEP, and that's the thing that European foreign policy stopped being the, an, uh, a tool for mercantilism, which is a good thing. We do not only support our commercial and economic interests, and this also turned out to be in relation to China, you know, blocking of the justice uh, agreement, uh, a treaty on justice. Uh, this, this is good that we are, the, the, the voice of the European Parliament is, is getting more important. You know, the member states will always think about what's the market for our telecom company or how many submarines or how many, you know, um, airplanes we can sell. But the European Parliament has a stronger position to, to support uh, the values, you know. The fact that foreign policy is no longer the tool of mercantilism only uh, helps the EU as, as, as a player, but also it can help us internally, but because if your values are for sale, or your, well, let's, let's stick to values, if your values are for sale in foreign policy, then your values will also be for sale internally. Jolt, you're an academic, could you, uh, we have a diplomat, we have a MEP, we have a, a media person, and you are representing the academia here. You are teaching in the politology department, the political science department. A number of these values or opinions, you know, the, you know, the loss of uh, popularity of the EU uh, that you mentioned yourself, to a great degree is a thing of the young people as well. To what extent do you perceive that the ed educational system should do things differently to explain what the EU is about because even though I was slightly ironic that uh, even though this will not solve a problem in the mass measure but every single step is important but without changing the education will not succeed right so it's, it's going to be only very difficult to imagine that the framework values of people and the relationships and the attitudes will change. So to what extent do you believe that this current hot debate about the future uh, of the universities, which is a part of this strategic thinking about the recovery and resilience plan, how are universities fulfilling this role? Because the whole, you know, Rector's Conference is now div divided and the current representatives of the government, which is trying to achieve that, is also has a different opinion. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. to, to the last part of your question, when it comes to topics we are discussing here, I believe what's much more important is the content and the uh, methods of education than the structure of universities uh, like academic uh, freedoms etc and definitely you know there is a huge room for improvement uh, of course we do have many courses on the EU EU policy etc but when it comes to high school uh, secondary schools and uh, elementary schools this is one of the critical elements that are lacking I would mention just a few financial literacy, media studies, so that people do not fall uh, to fake news, for, for fake news, uh, like sharing different articles uh, from dubious sources, or taking uh, bad loan.
Because our survey shows that half of uh, the uh, participants of the survey actually uh, opted for more uh, for this uh, for worse loan, or people are uh, willing to risk their health. Uh, all public surveys uh, s say that uh, the health is top priority. In spite of that, people are willing to risk their health because of fake news on the internet. So there, there's a huge room for improvement in our educational system when it comes to its content and the methods that are used. What should be the fo in, uh, sen in the center of our attention and also how we teach about those topics. Uh, this is really important. Uh, we should focus on the reform of the regional education and also the content and the methods. But of course, this is a very long-term process. If we start now, maybe we will see the results in 5, 10, 50, 20 years. But if I could comment on my previous uh, speaker, yes, we see drop in popularity when it comes to the EU or Western allies uh, and the Euro-Atlantic structures. But there is also um, the opposite process. There is a drop in illusions when it comes to illusions, how much China is going to invest here, how much Russia will be of benefit to us. Because 10 years ago, it was almost funny when you follow the Central European media and the politicians uh, who everybody, uh, when everybody was saying, we will be the gateway for Chinese investments uh, to the uh, Central Europe, when each and every country of the region was claiming that that was a bit pathetic, but um, the illusion was there. 10, 15 years after that, uh, now we can look around and see how many jobs uh, Chinese uh, businesses uh, have created, uh, where are those uh, millions, and now we see that it's all missing. Maybe there are more misunderstandings, and the Chinese are building or modernizing uh, the railway um, in uh, Hungary uh, under their new Silk Road. But this is an illusion. And it's not about Slovakia not getting the advantage uh, that the Hungarians managed to get because of their more friendly policy towards China, because the returns on that investment is uh, 200 plus years. Those are the estimates. It's not that it is highly um, highly inconvenient, but it's at the level of uh, economic treason and a huge room for corruption if the Hungarian uh, government builds this together with the Chinese government. What else could be the result? And another example, there should be this dispatched kind of uh, Institute of Shanghai University in Hungary. What is of benefit that from Chinese alone and from the taxpayer, Hungarian taxpayers' money, they build a branch of Chinese university? But, uh, and at the end of the day, the government has uh, pulled back um, because this project was so unpopular and was so heavily criticized, everybody was afraid of it uh, at the end of the day. They didn't want to they didn't want to invest annual budget for uh, Hungarian universities into this one project. And uh, then countries are going to eventually realize not only in CE region but uh, across the EU we cannot leave the Russian companies, namely Gazprom, to control majority of the, the gas stocks, uh, the gas. Uh, uh, yes, uh, 
um, on short term run, the Russians uh, really um, complicated things, but uh, eventually it will only lead to further diversification and um, the economic benefits from uh, from um, cooperation with the Eastern um, autocratic regimes uh, are scarce uh, and even less so uh, material uh, benefits. Okay, now questions from the auditorium. Please, your name and affiliation and then ask your question. Okay, uh, please introduce yourself. Tomasz Strażaj from SFPA. Thank you very much for this very interesting debate. Uh, I would go back to the support for the EU and especially the tools we should or could uh, use uh, in order to enhance the popularity or support of the EU. And, um, you know, we lulled ourselves. We kind of, um, we so, sort of got too laid back when it comes to the previous results of the public surveys. So we uh, really thought that it was all nice and rosy because uh, pr in the past the support to the EU was relatively high and now this uh, we got a wake up call when it comes to political area, our society, civil society, and we all together face this challenge. So the involvement of broad spectrum of partners and stakeholders in reinstituting trust in the EU, including municipalities, uh, local communities, NGOs, civil society, is a key question. And the, mm, the fact that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has its agenda and its program is great. We are the EU is a catchy slogan and it has its impact, but uh, due to the circumstances you may update it or kind of expand it or um, change it or work on it. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we need an expert debate on the benefits of our membership in the EU. It needs to be an integral part of the whole puzzle. And if we look at the project of the National Cl uh, Convent implemented by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs together with uh, other stakeholders, unfortunately there is no continuity because this project just appears and then vanishes and then it reappears. It has a different administrator every now and then. So now, Mr. Klus, I would like to really uh, reach out to you and let's think together how this project that focuses on expert discussion on the EU and recommendations in different areas of uh, pol EU policy, etc., how to make a an ongoing, efficient uh, um, tool that will be a part of the uh, national debate on the EU that should result in increased support to the EU and also re-establishment of the trust of public into in the EU. One more question. Thank you. Uh, we do have... Uh, do have question uh, time only for one more question because uh, we um, no, the prime minister is coming. Uh, I am uh, representative uh, Daily Pravda because you were asking about the, the power of the European policy. I can see the power of the EU policy uh, because yes, Macron and Scholz are visiting uh, Hungary, uh, sorry Moscow. But before that, uh, there are dozens of negotiations with other the representatives of uh, other EU countries and with the US. It's not about us without us. Um, maybe it's not perfect, but I think 
that really it has its point that I'm totally convinced that even though that Russia's reaction was that uh, they uh, that Russia doesn't want to have single answer from the EU but it wants uh, separate answers from the member states uh, of course it will be very glad uh, to divide us the Ministry of Foreign Affairs said something uh, very interesting we are here at the 20th review conference and uh, the European issues and affairs are born here. Uh, with all due respect to other ministries, uh, you know, there is only a handful of uh, representatives of other ministries uh, uh, that pay attention to the EU affairs. Maybe it would be good that each and every ministry would uh, have the EU uh, affairs in already in its name, like Ministry of Economy and the EU Affairs. <coughs> well, thank you very much for your opinion and the questions you put to me. I'll be very brief because the Prime Minister is coming. When it comes to the Convention and many other EU topics, I actually want to conclude my speech with it. Let me paraphrase President Kamadi. Do not ask what the EU can do for you, but what we can do for the EU. And let's, let us ask this question at least once a week. Each of us, also through the you know, social networks that are available to us, or through the articles that we are writing, you know, if every, I'm convinced that every single one of us takes advantage of the space. If you talk to the, the citizens at least once a week, this is the thing that the EU gives us, and this is the thing we, we can do for the EU, we'll do a great job. And the National Convention, you know, I'd like to see this as a continual activity, as, as a systemic activity. Let me ask, how did we promote the one that we had last December? I don't think we really succeeded, so we need to be more active on this. And to all of you, I'd like to remind that on the 18th of February, our call to participate in projects published by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is... is um, uh, Coming to an end, I'm sure this could be a great convention 2022, National Convention 2022, and many of other projects that you are carrying in your heads. Uh, so go ahead. We'll be very happy if we are able to cooperate on these topics together. And at the end of the day, I'm very happy that we also managed to fi find some strengths. All of us here uh, man uh, mentioned some strengths, and I had actually some other strengths in store. And I'm happy that this is not only about you know, a huge criticism. Of course, we shouldn't nationalize the the accomplishments of the EU and put all the blame on Brussels, you know, because this is not going to get us anywhere. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I cannot give uh, the floor for concluding remarks, but I believe, I'm convinced, that all panelists came with a large volume of great insights and uh, perceptions and uh, opinions and were very open and honest in evaluating the topic of our of our first panel and uh, after uh, hearing the speech by the prime minister you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to uh, think about your questions i'd like to thank miriam lexman radovan geist martin klus and jolt here who was also a very well full fully fleshed member of this panel thank you very much and now the panel will reshuffle. There's only a technical question, so please do not leave the room. Uh, we'll wait for the Prime Minister, but you can have a few minutes break before the Prime Minister will start his speech. Thank you very much.
Vážený pán premiér, Dear Prime Minister, dear State Secretary, Your Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome the Prime Minister here among us. Uh, I will, well, without much further ado, I'd like to give over the floor to you, Mr. Heger, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored. And I'm happy that I can talk to you today at this forum and also with great pride in, this, in these demanding days, demanding days, I uh, can tell you that Slovakia is a democratic country. We are a country respecting human rights. We are a country that is a responsible partner and ally. We have clear anchoring in NATO and the, United, uh, and, the, uh, and the European Union, and we are a fully-fledged member of both. I think it's quite obvious that we are stating this in our documents, but not only in our documents, also we proudly endorse this with our actions. Our government, in its uh, foreign policy direction, is not, does not want to cast any doubt on this. We are, quite pers uh, we are quite convinced about the inevitability of our alliance. Now is the time when it's very necessary to talk about the importance and relevance of what alliance actually means, the word alliance. You know, just talk about the collective defense as an example. It is exactly in these days when we all can realize very well and very easily how strong and relevant and important collective defense is and what it is what what is its role for the safety and security of countries and members uh, uh, citizens of these countries who are members of this collective defense what does an ally mean as a word there were years when we lived for many years in safety and peace we only recall and remember the times of war during the bank holidays, and official holidays, and maybe we forgot, even though we were mentioning very often that freedom and peace are never to be taken for granted, but we still nevertheless forgot what it actually means to be an ally of someone. It's not only about taking, it's also about giving. It's not only about advantages and benefits, but it's also about commitments, because this is an essence of correct and responsible relationships. However, in Slovakia we are experiencing in recent months strong attacks just against our essential basic values and principles. We can say that these attacks are, they've been a long-term phenomenon. However, in recent months they have intensified dramatically. We perceive these attacks uh, from the parts of the so-called disinformation scene, as we call them, but also from the ranks of extremists. And as I said, in the most recent months, unfortunately, these uh, attacks have uh, intensified. And just the, exactly the discussion about the DCA was the litmus paper uh, that helped us to uncover many things that were not quite clear, and it's quite sad that the, this, this extreme, the extremist scene and the disinformation scene has now new allies. You know, former leading politicians of this country have joined their ranks. You know, people who, in their times, were endorsing the, uh, you know, membership to the core of the EU, and these very people are becoming the leaders of this disinformation scene. They want to return us back to the period of the late 90s of the Prime Minister Mechiar, where when we were an unacceptable partner to the West, basically the black hole, to quote um, Madeleine Albright. So let me ask you the question, do we want to return there? Do we want to return there? And I quite, I'm quite convinced that at this forum and every single one who recalls the times of the Velvet Revolution and it's very quick and prompt and clear, no, we do not want to return there. Slovakia has seen 30, more than 30 years of uh, 
period of freedom, period of building of democracy, period of you know realizing what democracy actually means. Yes, today, after more than 30 years of this development, uh, of almost 30 years of independent Slovakia, we see that this is no easy road. This path sometimes takes us sometimes takes us to crossroads, and uh, perhaps we wouldn't even hope that the crossroads where we are standing today, we wouldn't even expect that we would get here. Nevertheless, here we are, and it turns it shows a clear fact: democracy, freedom, and peace are not to be taken for granted. They always stand and fall with people who trust in these principles and values, who endorse these principles and values, who are never silent and who clearly declare this with their words and actions. And our government clearly endorses this. Just like I said, we are under various attacks. We are a target in a hybrid war. It comes with a uh, perhaps some historical, mm, maybe not roots, maybe a roots is not the right word, but nevertheless we see that the governments of the Slovak Republic, the previous governments of this country, have underestimated these situations. We were taking our membership in the EU and membership in NATO for granted. It is quite possible that we didn't appreciate it sufficiently, that we didn't explain and we didn't talk to our citizens how important and how essential this is for us as a country, as a nation. This is a challenge for us that our government certainly wants to take up in great detail and deal with it and address this challenge. If I may, let me briefly take a look over my shoulder why the current days and weeks are this crossroads that I mentioned. Because we have two groups of people here and I'm very proud and very thankful for the people who remember the past crossroads that we took, maybe the biggest crossroads from the 1989, maybe other important crossroads from 1998. These are the crossroads where people, democratic thinking people, people who have respect to human dignity and understand what freedom means, didn't hesitate their hearts were burning with desire to endorse these values and their hearts are burning today as well and they promote these values also today but let me remember uh, so let me mention also the group of people who you know who show their true colors in full nakedness the people who either don't remember these two dates or these two dates never were really important for them just like they were for us let me just remember the year 1989 and the period before 1989 this was a period where these people you know these people lost their influence however the influence can always be provided by authoritative regimes and dictatorships but we never want to see this again in Slovakia and I say this as a prime minister of this government of this country so yes we are at the crossroads and our government will strongly invest in developing democracy and these people the other people they will always pull us out of the EU they will always try to pull us out from NATO but we will firmly stand they will not scare us they will not scare us just like they didn't scare us when we were deciding about the cooperation defense defense cooperation agreement with our allies so this is why, for me, as the Prime Minister of this country, it is a priority, first of all, to revitalize the pro-democratic values. I want to build this revitalization on inclusion, so putting together, combining the pro-democratic forces and mobilization of these forces across the civic society, starting with the young people, continuing with uh, the NGOs, artists, academia, politicians, leaders who are standing firmly behind these values the next the upcoming years in Slovakia the nearest future will be about democracy about freedom about the rule of law about human rights and values also I want to build this defense on courage we will not retreat to these alternative scenarios for Slovakia that 
put our security in danger, put the security and democracy in danger. It is important that we as the government increase the credibility and trust in the state as such, trust in the rule of law, fair government and a fair country that serves to its citizens. And it can't be done in any other way than by raising awareness, investing in, in education, and exactly by conducting various discussions and extending the, the space uh, in education to include the values and to include teaching about the periods when the, we had to fight for democracy in Slovakia. So, so every single one of us had in their DNA an understanding of what was happening in Slovakia, how we won and achieved our democracy, and that it is the key principle and value without which we do not want to and we cannot live here today. Also, we want to strengthen capaci the capacities for fighting disinformation. It means completing the center of hybrid threats and units at the respective ministries in relation to this activity. We will intensify our intelligence activity to uh, uncover hybrid operations. We will strengthen the cooperation with our partners across the EU and NATO, but also with Ukraine, gladly. And of course, we will support the strategic compass of the EU, because shared evaluation and review of threats and challenges to our security environment makes us stronger together. And to conclude this, let me explain that we want to address the challenges of the future, not the challenges of the past. We want to uh, master the green transformation. There is a great opportunity in it, new jobs, new investments, perspective for the young people who we believe will not be leaving this country for, for good, but that they will return and invest in their own country, in their own homes. Also, this is about the support of free undertaking, space for new startups, new stars that, Slovakia, that represent Slovakia globally. There's not few, there, there are quite a few, but we want to have more of them, more of these successful startups, and also the Recovery and Resilience Plan, which is a plan and an instrument to recover and increase resilience of this country. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude this by remembering the person who supported many of these values and endorsed many of these values with his life. He was one of the symbols of building of this democratic state and this good, good image of Slovakia abroad. Today we are saying goodbye to him. I know that you had a, a minute of silence remembering Eduard Kukan, but it's very important to carry this person in our hearts and in our minds because he was one of the leaders. He was members of the elite that lives in us and who built the strong basics and foundations of democracy and the Slovak foreign policy. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for your very open and well-structured address where you touched up on the Slovak foreign policy issues that uh, resonate in you. Before asking a couple of questions to you, I'd like to adequately welcome the Minister of Defense, Jaroslav Nač, who together with Ivan Korčok proved more than his human bravery uh, in the past weeks. We listened to the President and from your address it's clear that we are at a crossroad. And what do we keep on saying that we cannot challenge our membership in NATO or in the EU? Those are constant facts and that we should rather focus on technical aspects. Uh, when during the corona crisis the recovery and resilience plan was uh, announced, we thought that we would focus on more technical issues like how to make our country more 
digital, innovative, uh, greener, etc. But surprisingly, um, many questions and topics uh, have been put on the table that totally destabilized uh, the discourse and also the results of the survey cannot uh, be overlooked and we definitely should not ignore the results. The last week was a wake-up call, definitely, because what happened in the parliament was something unprecedented in its form and content. Has there been ever a moment that uh, the defense cooperation agreement would not be approved? Well, I don't think it was a wake-up wake up call. It was rather a climax because as I keep on following the um, fake news, far right, and unfortunately the former top political representatives, their acts have been alluding to this climax, but they were like they have they were covered. Or, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, they just uh, went open and uh, very. Um, Ruthlessly, they showed what are their true interests. Uh, we don't. Uh, we definitely don't want them to be the political representatives of this country. Those people with ruthless, self-centered in interests uh, uh, actually have caused wars in our um, history. We need political leaders that uh, don't uh, change their values, that are consistent, that stick to their values, to democracy. And I have seen in the process the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Defense how they really fought against all the fake news and the lies and uh, everything that had escalated before the voting in the parliament. And I was so happy for Petra Volhova to win a gold medal uh, on Wednesday morning, but uh, I really felt relieved only after the DCA was approved because Petra Volhova is a symbol of our sport and talent in Slovakia, but the voting was a symbol of our basics. Where are our basics? The depths, um, the roots of our country, um, our direction as a country. So it was a really strong message, and I'm very glad that uh, the kind of a Canadian uh, perseverance uh, was kind of present in those times because Canadian hockey players are famous for their mm, for their strong commitment and perseverance and we really didn't give up and we really fought against all the fake news and the lies but on the other hand, it gives me huge uh, energy for my uh, future work, because if you want to set the strategy right, you need to know the status quo. And that was definitely a tip of the icebreak that l disclosed uh, who stands for what values and interests. Now we do have those uh, two spectrums, and I'm very glad that now we clearly know who is interested in promoting democratic uh, free Slovakia and who is not. When you visit Brussels, um, the prime ministers and leaders uh, do have this doorstep uh, session and the journalists are pretty cheeky and bold and they ask an in every question and you need to just answer when uh, you visit Brussels next time and uh, you will get the journalists at the doorstep uh, asking, okay, uh, Prime Minister, you are coming from a country with the lowest popularity of the EU. And uh, you will get this question. You represent a country where most of the citizens don't think it's good to be a member of the EU. So what would be your response? I'm an optimist. 
I see a glass half full. I am glad that we can observe the highest intensity of communication about the EU issues. And uh, yes, this is a reflection of the fact that for many years we uh, were uh, not paying enough attention to this uh, topic, but the upcoming two years will really focus on talks about democracy values and about the, our direction. This uh, should be the main political topic. So that we yet again um, build the basic understanding of where we belong in the young population as well, so that it is inherent in all of us. Uh, uh, so it is totally natural to all of us. Uh, so if this question comes, uh, then um, then I will be glad. Uh, don't worry, be happy. Uh, but we need to really realize that happiness is not here for granted. Uh, but um, we need to just work on it and get used to it. Okay, you have mentioned that. Uh, uh, the fight against the fake news and hybrid war will become a priority in the second part of your term. We know that um, various ministries are uh, opening departments uh, fighting against the hybrid threats, uh, but we see in Globsec trends that Slovakia from all of the, of the countries of the CE region is the most prone country for accepting different fake news and uh, um, kind of uh, lies. Uh, so this is um, kind of uh, situation, status quo, and we have the highest the pro-Russian affinity from the region. Are you ready to hire more professionals uh, to fight this uh, phenomenon? Because uh, just to say that, okay, we need to do something about it without having uh, manpower for that, experts, uh, not politicians, uh, then we won't achieve uh, much. And what do you think uh, should be the role of the educational uh, structure? Yes, we are ready and we need to uh, tap to the professional potential and also to other countries that could help us and we can learn from. Uh, education is the basics and now we are in the final stage of the reform of the curriculum for elementary uh, education and I think we need to revisit uh, this reform and we need to really um, give more attention to history and related topics, to pay more attention to key moments of the Slovak history and expand this those topics to such an extent that students totally know what we are talking about. Uh, it, so it's it's sort of like gets into our genes, our system. Because if anybody and so that if anybody comes and challenges EU topics or other topics, then uh, it. W wouldn't work because uh, with the if you understand things, it's difficult to challenge you and to uh, kind of uh, lead you to um, lies. Uh, Slovakia is a uh, Slovak uh, society is uh, shaken. We have uh, gone through pandemic crisis uh, followed by economic crisis uh, of unprecedented uh, scope, and then energy crisis hit. And it's still around, and it raises doubts. And uh, immediately after that, it was followed uh, after the security crisis. This is a huge pressure on each and every human being. So no wonder those uh, doubts are here. Um, and this is a really uh, maneuvering space for any uh, Body who wants to destabilize the system and the people and their beliefs. And that's where we need to invest much more into preventing this uh, fake news uh, er 
elements to, uh, from flourishing and we need to present the truth to the people and uh, bring about the information that is important uh, to the people and also stability that is so much needed in uh, the life of each and every one of us. We have resources, we have human skills, we have boldness. It won't be easy, but it will be manageable. Slovakia has taken over its presidency in Visegrad four countries from Hungary this summer, and at the same time the Czech Republic will be presiding the European Union. So Czech Republic and Slovakia will be a frequent subject of discussion, of discourse, European discourse. But by the summer we should be able to present our eye about the European Union when it comes to the conference on the future of Europe. Is this going to be a document? where we are going to say or express what kind of European Union we want to see and if there was supposed to be some 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 uh, small line, a note, uh, which says Eduard Heger wishes that the EU is three dots. What would you add there? Well, yeah, I do look forward to this and I also do look forward to the Slavkov ski sheet format, Slavkov format. Uh, which also includes Austria, and uh, I want to coordinate my position with the Czech Prime Minister because Czech Republic and Slovakia could coordinate the Central European space because our value compass is set in a very, well, very similar direction, and we want to have our voice heard in the Central European uh, territory. And I, for my own behalf, I want to say that I wish that Europe is much stronger so that Europe is uh, the global leader, not only in green topics, we have much more to offer to this world because we are a beautiful continent, a diverse continent, and we know that unity in diversity is the most difficult thing to achieve, but we have all the, uh, all the uh, possibilities to achieve it. So I want Europe to become a global leader and uh, to become a strong, peaceful, courageous, sovereign Europe for the benefit of its citizens, Europe that can set forth or put forth the best values for all people all around the world. The last question before Madame Magda Vershariova wanted to talk to me, uh, mentioning something about culture that we could perhaps ask you about the culture. Uh, let me ask a spiritual question, the last one, on my behalf. The Pope even though if he visits uh, Slovakia, they're always in good mood because they feel they, they visit a, an exceptional country, an exceptional territory. John Paul II was famous for his relationship to Slovakia. He said, realize that you have a special place in the architecture of Europe. Something like this, he said. I'm paraphrasing. And the Pope Francis, last year, besides having us in heart, he said that Slovakia is like a beautiful poem. Why do you think that for the popes, they? Why do you think the popes have such a strong emotional reaction to Slovakia? I think this is caused by the mentality of our nation, of our country. We are a country that can, that lets uh, visitors experience acceptance. Acceptance, you know, something that everybody likes, and we are very specific in this. But where we need to be stronger is, you know, self-confidence, self-confidence, you know, becoming aware of ourselves. And this makes me return to education. There's no self-confidence and self-awareness if I don't know my history, if I don't know my roots, if I don't know the importance of the, the respective milestones our co my country went through. And this, I believe, is the reason why not only the popes, but everyone feels good in Slovakia. And I'm convinced that we will develop this and we will build on this and on these foundations. And uh, because this is a gift also for, the U for Europe, because when we are sitting behind the table with the leaders of other countries, we see what the respective countries are particular about. And Central Europe is known for its flexibility, inventiveness, you know, ability to adjust. But also, on the other hand, we need... I believe, add more uh, responsibility, not only declared responsibility, but experienced responsibility when it comes to uh, the rules, regulations, our uh, alliance, 
we know we have this in ourselves, but we need to develop this and we need to build on these foundations. This will be further enrichment for the European uh, European space. This is the 20th review conference of Slovak foreign policy. The first one was in 1999, and we've seen quite a few prime ministers, no offense, of course, and uh, Magda Vasharia was standing at the birth of Slovak Foreign Policy Association, who was always convincing us, sometimes in 1993, that we need such a non-governmental organization that would cultivate Slovak foreign policy and uh, foreign policy awareness and understanding of our role in the world. So, to conclude this, I'd like to give Ms. Vasharia well, the privilege of asking her question as the, as the chair woman of the oldest non-governmental organization in Slovakia, which is called Živena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Demesh, for the introduction. Co-founder of Slovak Foreign Policy Association. Dear Prime Minister, in your speech, you were the only one in the past several months to mention artists. You used the word artists. And before you arrived here in the panel, we heard about the need for the new narrative of the Slovakia, modern European Slovakia, Slovakia which will leave behind its romantic 19th century roots, etc. But, you know, officials cannot do that, Prime Minister. Officials cannot do that. Politicians cannot achieve this. The new narrative of a modern Slovakia can only be created by artists, by people of creation, people of culture, people from culture, artists, and especially writers. Culture, unfortunately, is lost from all the plans. The Ministry of Culture is getting rid of its responsibilities, of its essential institutions. It's getting rid of it. I wanted to appeal to you, please, if we really want to accomplish this change, and we do need to accomplish this change, we cannot do this without creative people, the people of imagination. This is the only thing I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I totally agree with you. I've mentioned, I mentioned artists intentionally because you, you said it better than I did. You know, creativity, imagination is something that supports any superb or above average results and we want to achieve above average results. I totally agree with you and on my behalf I can tell you that well first of all I grew up in the in, in cultural environment. My both parents were active in culture for many years and I believe that I'm very strongly influenced by that and uh, this certainly is an area that is yes not it is not talked enough it's not talked about enough uh, we, can't, we don't see enough culture in our plans yes but it is again about the civic society culture is the trigger of activization of citizens and their interest in the society they live in not only in the uh, public issues and public matters but uh, about everything uh, related to public space and culture can do it independently and in a, an attractive manner so this is an area where our government wants to invest and I'll be very happy if anyone who's interested helps us with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. This uh, means the end of the discussion with the Prime Minister. I'd like to ask the whole audience in the in the room here of uh, of the Ministry of uh, Foreign European Affairs, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister of the Slovak, the Government of the Slovak Republic, uh, on uh, my behalf and on behalf of those in this room and on behalf of those who are watching us uh, on the screen. Uh, and I'm happy that a number of uh, international diplomats could listen not only to the Madam President but also to you, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, let me wish you sufficient volume of antibodies against COVID, but also antibodies against the human evil that you sometimes need to compensate a great deal of optimism for the second half of the government whose tenure co continues and of, uh, and uh, thank you very much. And it was very interesting to be here to talk to you and listen to your comment, Madam Vasharyova. So let me part with you with, um, with the slogan that we have in the uh, the motto we have at the office of the government, we are building on uh, experience. We are taking advantage of our 
strengths and we never give up. Thank you very much. Have a great day.
Dobré, ještě pět poludně, vážení. Very good late morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dear deputy minister, I'd like to welcome you all to our next panel or introductory session to the next panel. that we will try to cover with Yaroslav Nat, the Ministry of Defense, who really deserves our respect for the courage and boldness he has um, demonstrated in uh, recent uh, weeks when uh, in the public discourse we can here, all those labels as traitors and treason, etc., directed towards him and other representatives, and uh, we are in very, very difficult times, uh, and we need to face this fact. Um, exactly as uh, the Madam President and the Prime Minister labeled the situation. I am Andrei Matyshak from Delhi Pravda. And um, firstly, we would like to talk, uh, or sir, sir, later on we will talk about the changes in the global security environment. And uh, we have already heard um, the um, tributes to Mr. Kukan, the former minister uh, Kukan, uh, the politician. Uh, he was so unique and exceptional. It was very uh, inspirational personality, uh, really with uh, strong values, and I would like to express uh, my and our uh, condolences to his family and uh, close ones, uh, Minister. Um, I will just uh, jump straight into the topic and uh, we have just got the news that Russia is pulling part of its uh, forces, uh, uh, military forces from uh, the borderline with Ukraine. So it gives us uh, feeble hope. At the beginning of this conference we were talking about what if we get a different type of news that something has happened at the border of Ukraine. Everybody is watching the situation closely. Minister, your first reaction to this piece of news. Um, are you more hopeful that the situation may not result in the um, armed conflict. Thank you very much uh, for your introductory words and um, for um, opening of this discussion. First and foremost, I want to greet Eduard up there. This is a huge loss for Slovakia as such, but that's life, I guess. Eduard, all the best to you up there. And I want to mention something I haven't heard um, so far. I want to um, really uh, greet uh, Ivan Korchok. Ivan, if you are following this conference, uh, cordial greetings to you. You were a great partner and companion in our fight. Uh, there couldn't be a better person uh, uh, to fight with me and the same uh, Miriam Ma uh, Mayer, uh, my uh, colleague from my ministry. Really, this was um, fantastic to fight together. 
Okay. So, of course, this piece of news you were referring to is a good piece of news, but uh, we need to put things into context. If uh, those words uh, are going to be confirmed that this unreasonable or unjustified uh, um, gathering of more than 170,000 soldiers together with uh, fighting in uh, technology and then uh, military forces at the borderline, uh, that is a clear-cut kind of a signal of a planned military attack. Uh, if this is not materializing and those uh, numbers are going to drop uh, in the upcoming days, then uh, this is a good news. We all wish for peace. We all wish for de-escalation of uh, tension because the conflict that is in the air, uh, the conflict in, um, in Ukraine would be mm, harmful to everybody in the world. Uh, but I'm a very um, sort of like cautious optimist, uh, so to say. Uh, so we need to follow what is happening, going to happen next. Okay, Slovakia is a um, EU member state, uh, NATO. Um, ally or member, and how do you see the European uh, dimension of diplomacy? Because in the first panel, uh, the discussion focused on the strengths and weaknesses of the uh, European policy, and the panelists uh, really could not uh, identify the strengths. So from your perspective, here and now, what is the role of Europe in this very tense situation from the uh, foreign uh, policy perspective? I want to disagree with you when Slovakia, um, when you said that the Slovakia is not a direct um, part of this, uh, those events. Uh, no, we are neighbors to Ukraine and we are members to NATO. And the potential uh, negative impact of uh, escalation of, uh, of this tension would be very significant on Slovakia. So we need to be very strongly present. That's why Ivan Korchok traveled to um, Ukraine. That's why our Madam President called with Zelensky. That's why our Prime Minister communicates with the representatives of Ukraine. I met with the uh, diplomats of Ukraine, therefore we are going to make uh, decisions towards Ukraine. This is all um, placed together. And I can't imagine any other situation that would be more relevant to us and we need to be involved in than this one. And of course the European Union needs to be a player in the whole process. And um, 10 years ago when we were talking that the that there is a minimum chance that there would be any major co military conflict uh, in Europe. Uh, now we see that this is not the case. The security situation is very fragile. And now this is the time when the EU can show its strength, when we can be all united and we are not going to make differences and uh, be grouped into countries that uh, some uh, think that the south vector is more dangerous, others say that the eastern vector is more dangerous, others say that migration. Now this is the right time for Europe to show that we are a strong player. And of course uh, we may have uh, lower capacities when it comes to its military potential because we can talk about a few future of joint uh, European defense, we are still at the beginning of the discussion itself and there is an alliance that has adequate uh, military forces, but we have a huge economic strength and also at the cost of the fact that we could potentially lose uh, from the short term perspective. From the long term perspective, we will definitely win and we need to use our economic a potential, considering all the problems we are facing, energy crisis, etc. And now we see how big a mistake was Nord Stream 2. Mm, so now we need to show what we can do and the EU representatives shouldn't really uh, get manipulated into the position that is so favorable for Putin. Putin wants to communicate with individual states, member states. He wants to divide us. Uh, our common uh, voice is very important. 
Okay, so I let you disagree with me. And yes, you are right. Uh, we are uh, totally directly involved. Of course, uh, Ukraine is our neighbor, and we should think about it. So yes, I didn't phrase it uh, well. But um, you have mentioned that we will make certain decisions in the upcoming days or upcoming time. Could you maybe specify what we were talking about? About. I think I have uh, said um, I have almost spilled the beans, uh, so um, you will uh, know at the right time what I am talking about in more details. Uh, Madam President, who opened our conference, uh, was very clear, and she said that she would really support uh, the defense potential of Slovakia also by the presence of NATO forces. How does this discussion look like in the government and what kind of steps Slovakia has made towards uh, NATO, NATO that keeps on uh, that uh, talks about creating similar structures as are existent in Poland or the Baltic states. The discussion has actually ended up in a different place than it uh, was supposed to due to circumstances. Uh, first, uh, the communication about DCA was combined with the discussion on strengthening our, uh, the, uh, the strength at the eastern border, then the uh, political discussion between uh, certain political parties and some political parties that used to represent um, that they, we are strongly anchored in NATO went um, to different um, uh, different uh, arena and I'm very disappointed by that and uh, on the top of that uh, the misinterpretation of pre-planned military maneuvers so uh, you know we have been talking about it for two years ago and this was misused for the sake of uh, of the uh, uh, of this uh, situation, but the cyber strike uh, military uh, drill uh, involves uh, seven countries, it is coordinated, and there is no problem in any country because we need to drill. And, you know, it was totally misinterpreted, and it was irresponsible, and it was misused for the political um, purposes. And the escalation of the situation in Ukraine, actually, all, the, all those factors uh, resulted in a situation that many people started listening to forces, uh, so, sorry, to people and representatives that were trying to scare our inhabitants uh, through hybrid means or uh, lies, and, uh, you know, uh, this uh, toxic cocktail uh, and uh, with uh, the former political mainstream uh, tapping into it, uh, this is a problem. In 2004, we joined uh, NATO because we realized that NATO guarantees our defense. We would never be able to defend ourselves by ourselves. And therefore, if the situation worsens at the eastern border, it's very natural for the NATO to do its homework. And that is to protect its members. This is very natu natural. Then it um, develops different plans to protect all its members, including the Slovak Republic. And after uh, unauthorized and illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, and after uh, the kickoff of the frozen conflict that sometimes, you know, um, starts burning in Donbass and Luhansk, uh, various of uh, our allies, Pol uh, Poland, Baltic states, uh, have uh, felt the need to have uh, the military presence of NATO. And uh, in the context of the events unfolding in Ukraine, the same need was felt by Romania, Bulgaria, Bulgaria and Hungary. Why Slovakia should remain the only part, the only, the only country from the eastern border that not only had uh, the CA with the, U the US, w uh, which turned us into the weakest uh, part in the chain, why we shouldn't take care of our defense, why we wouldn't uh, want the presence of the, of the military forces in our territory.
So you support some flag of infrastructure in Slovakia? Yes, but we need to not only link it to the situation in Ukraine that Russians say they are withdrawing forces and we stop thinking about it. No, these are the plans, these are the long-term defense plans. And in case of a very significant deterioration of the situation, you know, we activate the Article 5 and in preparation for activation of Article 5 of NATO, we would be asking our um, allies to come here. So if we create structures here consisting of uh, units with, which has capa capabilities that Slovakia is lacking, and we are working on that, well then of course this is not only strengthening our defense capability, but it will also save our money. Because we will not have to invest as Slovak armed forces millions and dozens of millions into demanding capabilities that the alliance can just import here. So theoretically, if we create this structure and we have this experience from the Baltic republics and Poland, how, how this could be, what, what could be the interest of Slovakia? What capabilities in particular? Well, I don't want to you know, advance too much because this requires also political discussion with our partners, but we can say what was also um, mentioned in the media, we have the offer from the Czech Republic, our ally, that if such structure was uh, to be shaped, they would be able to provide the capabilities that we theoretically would be interested in and the, the, the soldiers that we would be interested in. But we are at the very beginning of this discussion. I'm flying tomorrow uh, to Brussels to negotiation of um, NATO mm, member states, uh, ministers of defense. But it's not a question of days or weeks until this decision it will take longer. And we will see how the discussion is going to develop. Uh, be that as it may, I would not turn this into a scarecrow. We are a member of NATO, we are proud and fully fledged NATO member and if our allies are arriving here we would be thankful and proud for that and not to scare the population with total nonsense which sometimes is on the border of um, you know s mental health. You know, We keep hearing the stories about rapes of Slovak, raping of Slovak women in relation to DCA which is absurd. This is not responsible at all. Minister talking about the direction we should be taking. It was mentioned by the President, Madam President and the, the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm talking about the hybrid threat. On the other hand, the, the President and also Prime Minister partially mentioned the, the thing that we should not polarize the society. There still is a part of the population who are, well, maybe sometimes confused, but it doesn't mean that they are, you know, pro-Russian agents to exaggerate is a little, or they have no, some political agenda, you know. They somehow perceive the information that are in uh, great abundance, and sometimes people have problems, you know, with processing information. You very often, very directly communicate uh, your opinions, but how should we communicate with this, you know, I hope, style and majority, I hope this is still a majority, which sometimes is just confused. They are not pro-Russian agents or they wouldn't support authoritative tendencies. Yeah, I am absolutely confident this is a silent majority and it's okay and they are oriented and I perceive this fact and I'm happy that if the extremists managed to achieve something and people who started to abuse the defense policy to you know political mongering and hate mongering that they mobilized the actual silent majority you know a huge number of positive and supportive messages I received a huge incredible number you know and these people think yeah okay so far we've been silent because it looked everything is fine but now seeing what's the alternative now we have to raise our voice and it's good and I'm happy that this is happening this is supposed to be like that we want to be communicating openly and fairly and it's a number of factors you know I haven't been in politics for a long time however but I expect that the defense and the security of the country is not um, a matter of politics. We could be talking about membership in NATO, membership in the EU, the relationship with our allies. You can have a different opinion, okay, but fear-mongering with nuclear weapons, you know, taking of the cl closing of the roads between uh, Banska Bystrica and Sliac Airport, you know, absurd, absurd lies spread by the people who should be responsible. This is what is very disturbing. And at the same time, we have uh, local elections 
coming, and these mayors, the, the, the mayors and towns politicians, they know what's the truth. You know, when they meet us, they tell, tell me, you know, I know this is stupid, but we need to play a little theater because the, the elections are coming. And this is not responsible politics, but I would rather tell you with full seriousness that I'd rather be blunt. I may sometimes sound arrogant a little, but I'll be telling the truth. And I'm willing to take back the political, you know, backlash for that. But I will not monger, I will not deal in fear. And if someone, uh, if someone says, you know, if, if you are, if, when, if, when you are an, uh, an ambassador of Slovakia, you, know, you support uh, DCA signing, but when you are in the opposition, then you are against it, you know. And uh, just like the former prime minister, when he became the, the uh, leader of the opposition, he now says that this is a catastrophe, it's, it's, it's treason. You know, this is highly irresponsible because we're talking about the defense of our country. I will be communicating fairly and openly with people if I get adequate feedback. Or even if they disagree with me, if they are decent and polite, okay, fine. But if someone calls me, a tr someone accuses me of treason and selling out my country, well, sorry, that's... It. And if it's... Uh, and if we say that, you know, a, a big hole requires a rough patch, then I'm all for that. Well, of course, the communication is different for everyone, but I hope you're right, that, Minister, that perhaps the silent majority has woken up. Let's hope that in a few months, maybe, we will see also the, the public opinion polls that it is turning a little, because we've had a few quite disturbing uh, and threatening results of public opinion will public opinion polls in terms of how the Slovak population perceives who's, the, who's causing the problems in Ukraine because most people say it is USA and NATO and not Russia even though the truth is pr pretty obvious but we have the survey of the EU saying that the smallest portion of the population historically perceives the, the benefits of EU membership so and this is also related to hybrid threats that you mentioned and the president mentioned and the prime minister mentioned. There's a, is there any plan for f combating hybrid threats on the table? And could you perhaps tell us what for you means combating hybrid threats and what's the goal of this combat? Well, it's going to be an action plan for sure. Hopefully it's going to be a combat. You know, the fact is that we are truly preparing a document which has been interministerial comments procedure. It wasn't easy, but in the upcoming weeks, uh, we would like to mm, submit this material to the government negotiation. It talks about 62 steps that need to be performed at the nationwide level, it's government level. So it's not only the Ministry of Defense, but it goes above the ministries. So I hope this is going to be approved by the government. It's going to be one of the most important documents in this sphere, but not the only one, because a number of other ministries are preparing materials for cyber defense, etc., etc. So it makes me glad, and then also the support that was clearly declared by the Prime Minister makes me glad, because this is a very important topic. Just need to read the, the published <coughs> reports by, the, by our intelligence authorities and trust you, you can trust me when I read these non-public reports, I'm shocked by what is happening, what is happening in this country. You know, really, we need to be, we need to be very, very careful. Democracy is a great thing, and no one has ever came up with a better concept, but someone actually betrays their country and, uh, and, uh, and lawlessness they replace with they, they they confuse it with democracy. So we need to strengthen our strategic communication. We need to strengthen our democracy, and we need to think about what is freedom of speech and what is uh, spreading of false alarms. But if Kotleb and Mazurik are saying that that the, that there's going to be a concentration camp for non-vaccinated people in the military space of Lesh, well, this is not freedom of speech. This is this is fear mongering, you know, telling people that if they are not get, if they don't get vaccinated, they will be in concentration camp. This is a targeted, concentrated, willful, deliberate attack, which has nothing to do with supporting uh, our, our our nation, our democracy, and our state. But it's actually promoting the interests of other powers. 
Well, this panel is titled as Change of a Global Security Environment, and I'm sure we could be talking about this topic for long, long, long hours. But what do you think are the major elements of this change of global environment and how the armed forces of Slovak Republic are preparing for it? Now, these elements of change are numerous. We could be talking about China. Uh, well, okay, what is most worrisome for Slovakia? What concerns Slovakia m the most is obviously the situation in Ukraine. There's no doubt about that. When we talk about hybrid uh, uh, operations, I'm convinced that a number of these hybrid operations which are taking place in Slovakia are taking place to influence public opinion in relation to what is happening in Ukraine. That's a fact. You know? And let's not pretend that strengthening of the influence of China globally is not concerning us. It, it is. China is really using its capital, its economic capital, to secure strategic ports, airports within the EU. This all has influence on Slovakia as an EU member, and some of the locations are very close or in our territory. This is a fact. These are the elements of change. And also the um, unpredictability of, uh, of steps, the number of conflict zones around the world, uh, Americans focus m more on India Pacific area. They want the EU to take over more military responsibility. We are gradually succeeding to increase um, defense budgets. We were at 1.63, now we are at 1.8 billion. And uh, I believe, well, I'm a realist, I don't think we will not achieve 2%, uh, so 1.63%, now it's 1.83%, so we will hopefully get close to 2% and we will modernize the military, not only in terms of capabilities and technical capabilities and infrastructure, which is extremely important and was neglected, but also in terms of preparedness and resilience to new threats, cybersecurity, a number of other things, you know, intelligence, intelligence capabilities, and a number of things that we live in this ministry on a daily basis. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm actually quite happy in uh, terms of what, inf uh, what information we are collecting, what the military intelligence is doing. You know, apart from the past, let me knock on the doors, there are no affairs in relation to mini uh, military intelligence. We are sharing relevant information which clearly uh, reflect something that we are calling hybrid threats to Slovakia. So we have also a question from Slido, and there's a question about NATO. Sometimes it seems that NATO is not unified. Isn't this also a reason for low trust of the citizens? And let me ask you directly, are you convinced that if something happened in the Baltic Republics or Poland, God forbid, do you think that Article 5 would really, would really be, you know, um, uh, respected uh, principle and we would all support the uh, our alliance? I'm totally convinced about that because I used to work um, in NATO. This is a holy grail. This is totally unquestionable. This is what uh, the alliance is based on. In it was established in 49 and in 30, 73 years of its existence it has managed to secure the fact that um, uh, nobody has ever dared to attack any of its members. So that's why it is the most successful uh, defense alliance. And yes, we do have pl defense plans of alliance and everybody keeps on saying that in case of an attack, everybody else is going to react, all the other members. And I really didn't understand the question that uh, about uh, the alliance not being unified. And yes, um, sometimes there are discussions, but it all it adopts it uh, all its decisions in single voice, and there is stability. And I do believe that uh, it will agree on its new strategic concept. Uh, in Madrid in, its, uh, in the upcoming summit and if somebody is misusing uh, statements taken out of context uh, for instance of President Macron about uh, clinical death etc this is absolutely not fair and 
You know, that's why uh, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, because its member states didn't want uh, it to exist. Uh, but, and we shall not forget that the Warsaw Pact attacked uh, one of its members. So uh, this was a very important factor. Mr. Strajai. Uh, we are very sorry, but we do not hear the question. The interpreters apologize. The speaker is not using microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I was uh, in the auditorium and uh, the Prime Minister was speaking, I uh, had this idea that it's so bad that uh, there is not a NATO flag here on the stage. Uh, yes, we don't have uh, such kind of affinity or we don't use uh, NATO flag so often. There are countries that use it all, of, uh, all the time, such as Poland, and then there are other countries that, that uh, use it less. But still, we need to, um, we really should uh, promote our membership in NATO. Um, uh, the public supports uh, our NATO membership uh, by 63%. This is the highest ever. And I wouldn't be so pessimistic about the EU, even though I have seen the s survey. If people were to decide whether uh, yes or no, 36% of the EU citizens was yes, 26% uh, was uh, I don't care, and then uh, the rest was uh, no. People in Slovakia do feel that uh, this is uh, not relevant to us, but uh, if people uh, realize that most of the public development happens from the EU money, and if we have taken away uh, freedom of travel, or working abroad, studies, Schengen zone, away from the citizens, then I think uh, they would change their opinion. People do have short memory, and we need to communicate this with uh, the citizens. Uh, I had the same idea about the flag. Uh, we do have the Ministry of European and Foreign Affairs. Maybe we should have Ministry of Defense and NATO. I would uh, like to redirect our discussion to national arena. The defense uh, ministry uh, has submitted a new concept of defense uh, and also the amendment of uh, the military act or act on defense and my question is the ministry what is your vision when it comes to um, development of active um, uh, military backup uh, reserves okay we need to uh, break this question by the mandatory military service uh, by or uh, abandoning this concept 
we have less people uh, who would be actively ready and prepared for active defense of, uh, of uh, our country. Uh, we have very limited reserves, so we can only get a couple of dozens of people annually. In the Czech Republic, they have a s easier system. They have a uh, structure the system in such a way that uh, uh, this who will become a member of active military reserves uh, need it, uh, would need to have uh, military history or uh, would have needed to be uh, a former soldier. And we should follow the uh, should follow the Czech road. Uh, the Czech pass away. Uh, the system is being subject to change, and I'm glad you have mentioned it because this is one of the important aspects uh, that uh, I really give priority to as a minister. And the second uh, aspect, when talking about reserves, military reserves. This has to do with mobilization. This is potentially unwanted phenomenon. Uh, in case of mobilization, in case of uh, military conflict, or at the, in case of direct jeopardy or threat, and we need to make uh, legislative adjustments in order to be ready. Uh, and better prepared, because it seems that the current legislative process is really obsolete. The war has also, the, the military things have also speeded up, and we need to be much faster in order to be able to defend ourselves. Okay, uh, we need to close our discussion, uh, but Professor Sten wants uh, to say something, so I'd like to hand it, hand it over to him. I don't have a question. I would just like to follow up on Tomasz Straja's comment. I have an experience that if the basic information on NATO gets to the kids, if the Ministry of Education sort of includes it into the curriculum, um, and the children then talk about what they uh, were learning, uh, Mm, and then they come home and they discuss with their parents and grandparents about uh, the subject. Uh, then it brings really benefits. It is very useful, and I totally agree with you. And uh, just recently, we approved that the government uh, document the concept uh, rel uh, on defense about the perception of defense uh, on the national level, social level. And there are particular tasks uh, regarding uh, readiness, uh, military readiness and defense readiness uh, to become part of the curriculum. And this will be, this will go far beyond what is happening now that we visit students of elementary and high schools and universities and we discuss uh, matters of reliance, but it will be much more systemic and comprehensive. I totally agree with you and we are really making uh, specific steps and we definitely need to do things uh, in this area. I used, I used to teach and in 2000 I was in a group of uh, young uh, teachers who were trying uh, to really uh, increase uh, the number of topics related to NATO in the curricula, however, not much has changed. Um, there are many questions, uh, but unfortunately we need to close our discussion because the minister needs to leave. A very happy minister that you, you found time, carved out time for this conference, and uh, thank you for your attention. Good luck.
Pán štátny, počujeme sa? Zmrzli sme? Asi u neho. Dobre, tak budeme musieť vyriešiť tento. A dobrý deň, pán štátny, počujeme sa? Asi nie, zatiaľ. My, ho, ma, my, ma, my máme vypnutý? On má vypnutý? Ma, prosím vás, máte vypnutý mikrofón, myslím. Áno? Dobre. Dobre. Ešte chvíľočku strpenia, technické veci. We'd like to ask for a few seconds of your patience. We need to deal with some technical issues. Halo, halo, počujeme sa? Á, výborné. Počujeme sa, áno. OK, so it seems that we finally hear each other. Good afternoon, State Secretary. Okay. Now it seems that both parties hear each other with a little bit of echo. Okay, you will hear me twice. That's good. No, just kidding. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome all of you who are still in the room. We know how this happens after the politicians leave, the room gets a bit emptier, but the turnout is still good. Dear ladies and ge dear gentlemen, welcome to the next panel of our review conference. You know, uh, all politics is local, after all, so it's not, even though it's foreign policy, it is our foreign policy and our foreign policy conference, our review conference. Let me follow up on the discussion we've had with the Minister of Defense, Mr. Naj. We have panelists, four of them, and um, I need to point out one thing. It doesn't happen very often. I'm very happy and I'm glad we have a balanced panel. We have two ladies and two gentlemen. Yeah, instead of me, there could be another lady. Sure, there's more than enough la of ladies who would manage even better than me. Nevertheless, this topic is... Uh, very important for me to emphasize because this is all what we also need in foreign policy. So let me welcome online uh, the State Secretary, uh, Ma Marian Meyer, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Defense, who unfortunately has a positive COVID test. Hopefully you are positive also in your mind, not only in terms of uh, antigen uh, to COVID-19 or antibodies to COVID-19. Nevertheless, we hope, uh, State Secretary, that you will be okay and your disease will be over very soon. Thank you very much for being with us online. I'd like to thank you. And now, as we said, we have uh, panelists also here in the room. Uh, Lucia Yar, Editor-in-Chief in Euraktiv. Katarina Klingova, uh, who is with Globsec, who is in, in charge of uh, hybrid threats in Globsec and uh, new trends in disinformation spreading. Thank you. Welcome. And Alexander Duleba, we could say on the home turf, because Alexander, as you all know, uh, comes from Slovak Foreign Policy Association that also prepares this conference. So we are, we are honored by your presence, Mr. Duleba. We will not... Uh, we will not talk for too long. There will be no, you know, opening five 
minutes of speech because then it, this turns to 10 or 15 minutes. So let me directly, in medias res, follow up on the thing that Minister was mentioning and realizing this is a, a, a thing that we are all following very closely because it's very important for us. So let me put a similar question that I actually did to Minister. How do you explain, how do you perceive the message about the withdrawal of at least one part of uh, Russian forces from the Ukrainian borders. Is this uh, a symbol of something, a symbol of something positive perhaps? And has the diplomacy played its role in this development? I might not be fully, fully protocol compliant, but since we have an expert here on Ukraine, perhaps but there's no better expert on Ukraine in this country. So let me ask you first, Mr. Dulabar, what's your take on this? It's good news for, for sure. It's, a, it's good news, finally, a piece of good news after many, many long weeks of negative or bad news. And I also had the possibility of uh, reading um, the or watching the the piece of news in the uh, first Russian channel, which w w it, it was uh, it was uh, the, the information about the Putin meeting uh, Minister of Lav uh, Lavrov, the foreign foreign minister of Russia, then Defense Minister Shoigu, and there was a clear signal from the Minister of Lavrov that negotiation must continue, that he received the mandate to negotiate, which is great news. But at the same time, it was um, emphasized that the negotiation will not go on forever, which can be interpreted as, uh, well, I don't, no, I don't take the liberty of interpreting what exactly this means. Nevertheless, we will see what happens. I mean, uh, we, I'm afraid that this is going to be, you know, in the state Duma, there is the proposal of uh, declaration of independence of both these separatist republic so there's going to be a lot of strong diplomatic and political activity so both these republics will you know declare themselves as independent countries and the russian army will be there i mean it doesn't have to be 100,000 russian soldiers there can be just 10,000 soldiers and there's a great dilemma for ukraine how they will react to that because it is a ukrainian it is ukrainian territory of course and even though if we pretended until now that these are, you know, just uh, unidentif unidentified people in uniform, now there's going to be a Russian army officially, so how Ukraine will react? It's not easy to say, well, let it be, because when we talk about public opinion, uh, you know, in the case of Ukraine, the, the support of uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian accession to NATO is much, much larger, and also in terms of how Ukraine should react to the Russian aggression. So being a Ukrainian politician, for example, the President Zelensky now, if really tomorrow the, the, the regular Russian army will go into these separatist republics and telling the nation, like, okay, l let's just leave it as it is, you know, you can't do that, and it's, uh, it's going to be, you know, shifting the ball to the other part of the court because now the pressure will be transferred internally inside Ukraine. There's one 13% political party which would uh, support this sort of uh, agreement with Russia. Let's uh, agree to the Russian, uh, Russian conditions and basically all the President Zelensky was suggesting this which was of course a very different situation. That was a very different situation. He was a different president and he had maybe naive ideas, like he said, we will meet, we will talk, and we will, you know, find a solution. That was very naive, and it didn't work like that. So we can witness, if this scenario is true, that uh, there will be Russian military in there, it will be a mechanism to transfer this pressure and then tension internally. So how will Ukrainians decide? They will go fight? And, you know, what will they tell to Europe? And if the Russians are withdrawing and you are attacking, you know, the whole, whole matrix will turn, the tables will turn, basically. And the, in the logic of the chess play from the Russian...
apart. Now they understand after weeks of visits and negotiation, Biden, Scholz, Macron, Macron in Moscow, they understand that there truly is unity, that if they start something, there will be a unified, hard and severe reaction, economic sanctions, you know, strengthening of the eastern uh, wing of, uh, of NATO, etc., etc. So this was a diplomatic thing that the, the West managed successfully, if this is the result of that, of course. But of course, that the game is not over. It's quite obvious, uh, which is from the meeting of the ministers and the President Putin, And so there was a very strong message. If this is true, then this is the way how the second round can start. The second round of proving that uh, Ukraine is not trustworthy, is not stable, that it's actually a country that uh, you need to agree with us what we need to do with this country and you will need to accept in the end of the way, in the end of the day uh, uh, that we have taken over Crimea, etc. But those are speculations. Uh, uh, this cannot be won by military forces from e either of the sides, but this is uh, an information war. This is going on in other countries and uh, Ukraine will still be the battlefield. And the war is going on and it would be a very naive thing to believe that uh, it's over. So I don't think that um, the game is over, definitely not. So of course this was a relief but this is not the end. And how to shift it inside of Ukraine, maybe Slovakia, we were the most ready from the Western countries where something could have been, uh, they could have done, but I and if maybe if they have had six to seven Slovakias, they would dare to do other things. But since this hasn't happened, there will be a new stage of the conflict. And we should be able to read it, to understand it, because there will be very um, inconvenient things, uh, many inconvenient things, and there will be a PR that will serve to the narrative. <laughs> Deputy Minister, I will ask the same thing as uh, I have asked the Minister, and Mr. Damesh was saying that maybe we have cheeky questions as journalists, but uh, the minister kind of alluded to the fact that we are planning as a country to support Ukraine, to do some something. I was listening attentively to the minister and the deputy minister never says more than the minister, so I would leave it there. Let me just say that there is this impression that Slovakia is lagging behind or has done not hasn't done much when it comes to help to Ukraine. I know that the current politics is happening online and everybody tries to be the forerunner when it comes to the news and many of experts sitting in at the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs uh, know that uh, foreign policy is well thought through and not always you need to be the first one but you need to give the adequate answer. So if uh, we have made use for discussions, for assessing the needs of Ukraine, our possibilities and consulted uh, our partners, then we would and we will react uh, very soon and very clearly. I think Slovakia 
is very uh, transparent when it comes to its foreign and European policy. And there can be no doubt that the current Slovak government supports single and unanimous approach of the alliance and of the EU and also long-term commitments or long-term issues such as territorial integrity of Ukraine, etc. And so it's not only about the assistance, even though the, there have been, uh, even though the symbols are really important, we do perceive it and we believe that the Slovak government will uh, act responsibly and is already acting responsibly. An add-on question. Our unity in the EU and Western world and transatlantic treaty is the strongest thing we have at hand in this kind of situation, the strongest thing we can show to Russia. You definitely participate in different meetings, negotiations with the partners, and the communication uh, between both sides of Atlantic is very intense. Um, how is it going? Is it rather smooth process or is it a bumpy road? due to the fact that uh, may, actually there is this level of realization that we are at the gateway of conflict. Well, without painting the picture in pink, I really believe that all the countries intensively realize how serious is the situation. I remember uh, the times uh, of the crisis of uh, Crimea annexation and, uh, uh, you know, the messages from NATO were kind of like conflicting. Uh, there were countries that didn't realize back then what it meant and tried to kind of uh, downplay the situation and the risk. And I think this is the lesson we have all learned. So now even the, those countries that are um, not as strict as some others. Now there is not a, any country that would challenge steps that are taken by the alliance. And of course, a very constructive U.S. approach is of help. The U.S. and the U.S. administration comes and approaches its allies also on a bilateral level to learn about the attitudes and positions uh, exchange or, or learn the intelligence. And this is great. It's not about uh, somebody announcing uh, what is going to happen and everybody just needs to join. So it's a great combination of the circumstances and I believe that it's really good that the individual stakeholders are pretty concise and clear when it comes to their action and I think this is uh, a bit disturbing for Vladimir Putin and Russian administration and that's why Minister Lavrov keeps on reiterating and wants us to answer uh, each for um, its own. Like they want single answers from member states. They want to break our unity, but they are not getting there. Thank you very much. And uh, I have a short announcement for you. We have invited the representative of one of the opposition parties to our panel, but unfortunately, uh, uh, due to workload and time constraints, uh, he couldn't participate uh, just uh, to be on the fair side. And unfortunately, the uh, speaker of the national parliament won't be able to make his presentation, but maybe this will give us more time for discussion. Um, uh, 
No. I have a question for Miss uh, Klingova. Uh, Ukraine is our neighbor. We have border with it. And Ukraine is a big state. It's definitely not a small country. What does Ukraine mean for the EU? We should get back to 2014 and what happened back then. This didn't have to do with the fact that Ukraine wanted to join NATO or something alike, but we're talking about the association agreement. And since we are talking about the EU and strategic compass and similar things, we need to look to our neighbors. And uh, Ukraine is our neighboring country. What does it mean for us? You have mentioned that Ukraine is a huge state, but it's not the only huge state at our borders. Next would be Turkey and other countries. So, We haven't learned uh, what to do with the neighboring issues. Uh, maybe, you know, there are some particular efforts, but there is no political will in various areas. And uh, maybe I will detour from Ukraine for a bit, and I will focus on the political will, on the European political will in the context of uh, the efforts uh, for the European sovereignty to be a real player when it comes to the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. The political will is lacking, but uh, since you have mentioned strategic compass, it doesn't pay attention to this topic. So we have certain capacities, we have military capacities, actually we have the different European institutions. Um, and uh, the EU has certain potential, but we can't use it. We weren't able to use it, uh, we weren't able to use the European peace uh, instrument that was to rip plays the Athena um, system and the new tool that was to fund the peace uh, talks, etc. We had enough people to send to such uh, a hotspot. Uh, European Union is working on it, but we still are lacking political will in order to have a leverage. And This is not a bipolar world anymore. We have multiple uh, major forces, uh, major leaders. We have the US, China, Russia, EU. We are economic uh, superpower. We have the biggest volume of trade, actually bigger than China. We are a normative power. And this is my preferred topic, really, because uh, we are a bureaucratic machine and we manage to develop norms in areas that have been uncovered and that are really the baseline. Media, hybrid social networks, etc., GDPR and others. Yes, we don't like them. Uh, but uh, we are getting to the international level and actually to the global level and other countries are getting inspiration from us. Uh, so yes, we are superpower and we need to learn how to protect our soft force. Uh, because, uh, okay, I was saying that uh, this is not a bipolar world anymore, but uh, multipolar world and our power is also measured by our defense capacity and uh, the efforts to 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 take 
on the the hard power are growing and now I'm getting to this point that uh, there is some um, weakness in the defense capacity of the European Union and uh, we feel it here in Slovakia because the EU whether it wants it or not maybe also due to external uh, influences maybe also due to the US uh, the EU wants to have functional and effecti efficient defense it needs it there are structures we are building it we are developing it but we are still lacking political will and also, mm, I believe that here at the premises of the Ministry of uh, European and Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense, I am not in the talks uh, directly, but I still believe that all those structures that, uh, that the EU is trying to develop in the area of defense, we are not paying enough attention. And uh, because they are still not working well, but we shouldn't forget about it because uh, NATO partners want it from us, uh, US wants it uh, from us, uh, and we need to have partnership. You can, you, we need to have an eye-to-eye -eye type of partnership, uh, not uh, really unequal, because otherwise we won't be able to work in this uh, environment, and then we need to be able to actively work in those conflicts as at the Russian-Ukrainian border. Amen. Ms. Kalingova, you deal mainly with hybrid threats and the issue of spreading disinformation in related areas. Can we say, from your, you know, based on your research, um, to what degree is this disinformation seen at this moment, but also in the long term, the, there is the importance of the, the topic of the relations between Russia and Ukraine, Russia versus NATO, Russia, EU. How important this topic is at the dis disinformation scene and how does the scene actually approach these topics and how this impacts the Slovak public opinion. The relations between Russia, NATO, Russia, EU, or the geopolitical orientation of the respective countries, whether it's Slovakia or other EU countries in our region, are a primary, one of the primary objectives or primary narratives of this disinformation scene. All various actors that are spreading uh, conspiracy theories or disinformation, we don't observe this only for for the moment, but we've been observing this for years. You know, I've been working for Globsec, mm, I, for the I also work for the Center of Democracy and Resilience. Our center was established in 2015 because it was exactly at that period of time with the annexation of Crimea and the conflict in Ukraine, we saw overnight how some online websites started to, you know, deal with the geopolitical questions, they started to spread conspiracy theories uh, about why Slovakia should leave the NATO, should leave the EU, they started to spread various disinformation about the Brussels narrative, you know, conspiracy theories about Slovakia, uh, will, uh, Slovakia serving as a territory for nuclear weapons or for movement of the allied forces as a preparation for um, occupation of Slovakia by NATO forces, etc., etc. These are narratives which are mm, the objective uh, of uh, actors spreading this information. Unfortunately, as the Prime Minister said, or the President, Madam President, or the Minister of Defense all mentioned that recently we've seen a great increase in intensity and a n large number of political actors are taking over these narratives and they help spreading these conspiracies. That's why it is very important to have the debates just like today, debates with you know ordinary people and citizens to show them what really is behind these PR games and populist discourse of not only our politicians, but as Mr. Duleba pointed out, Russia is, well, maybe withdrawing its units for now from the Ukrainian border, but the next round of the PA game starts and it will take months. And the, 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 the conflict itself, you know, was 
preceded by almost two year information operation where a number of pro-Russian actors or the media machinery of Kremlin was spreading a huge volume of um, disinformation and about Ukraine, about its representatives. So this is a long-term process and we need to be able to react efficiently to any informative operations spreading not only in Slovakia, not only about Slovakia, but also about NATO, the EU, at home and abroad. I don't want to be provocative for no reason. Let me just uh, say that I want to make sure we learn our lesson and I will also ask this question to the State Secretary who is directly involved. Ms. Klingova, you said that these things have been taken for, have been taken years and I guess all of us here have encountered them in one form or another. It reached its uh, <coughs> climax uh, in the DCA uh, debate, but I will pro we will probably continue also afterwards. Looking back at our shoulder, you know, over our shoulder, uh, it's not about you know empty criticism. It's about learning a lesson. Was there anything in uh, strategic communication that could have been done better or that could have been done differently? Obviously, there were factors that no one expected to materialize just like the general prosecutor and his role nevertheless we could have known that it will you know that this will raise some eyebrows so was there something we could have done differently well of course we've analyzed the strategic uh, communication of the Slovak Republic in 2019 and we found out that already at that time there were mm, very few I think only three uh, public authorities dedicated to uh, strategic communication. Of course, in relation to the elections and the, the, the change of the government, there was obvious change in strategic communication. There was improvement, but we still cannot expect that the strategic communication of the whole country in such, in, in, in such um, matters will be taken care of by four or five representatives. This must go across the board. It must be agenda by all central authorities, state authorities. It must be also supported by the you know, regions where these narratives need to be amplified. And this is not happening. Various analyses show that opposition leaders or the d disinformation scene, they have established a network of Facebook pages, Facebook groups, or websites that very efficiently amplify the narratives. Already in 2017, uh, uh, the, the political party of, uh, of Marian Kotleba had 130 Facebook pages. They've created the whole network across various levels, all across the Slovak territory, which helped them very quickly and efficiently amplify their, their various disinformation narratives. So we are missing this. We are missing uh, a coordinated effort and coordinated strategic communication at the state level, which needs to be linked, interlinked, where the respective uh, central public authorities will be sharing, supporting the, uh, the, you know, the, the narratives. Of course, we don't expect the respective ministries to amplify some you know, messages uh, but they need to find their own narratives within their respective agendas that fulfill the building of demo democratic society, protection of democratic processes in Slovakia, and that support strengthening of the message that we are NATO, we are the EU, that we are the West, right? And not that Slovakia can be the bridge between the East and West, because we are the West, and we need to emphasize this across the across all the levels and across all the ministries. We've already mm, heard mm, uh, Professor Stern. Uh, we've heard also Madame Vasharyova. We need to involve the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Culture, to really support the long-term work of building a uh, very strong strategic narrative, positive narrative of Slovakia, build the culture, build the values between us. 
This is not a question of selected ministries. This is a question of the whole society, nationwide approach. Mr. Duleba, after uh, listening to the colleagues here, I just came up with an idea. You know, I see a, an issue here, and we haven't been talking about it yet. You know, this, you know, how to how to grasp the fight against disinformation, and I come, and I compare the 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 nineties with the present or with, with the period twenty fourteen, twenty twenty two. In the in the nineties we were meeting even with Mr. Khmelar and Mr. Charnogorsky in the various discussions, but we were all using rational arguments and they were using rational arguments. So it was a rational debate, even though we may have disagreed, but it was a rational debate. But what is happening now and it's a result of this information war the war of disinformation is that the, you know, you can't build a counter-information policy if you only appeal to reason, to rational thinking, because this this disinformation today is is about emotions. If you don't have an argument, then you are a Jew, you are a foreign agent, or something. We didn't have this really in the media in the 90s or in the discourse. You know, this is about liquidation of someone who has rational arguments because I have no rational arguments so I attack uh, at hominem I will cast their identity because you know, he or she is paid by a foreign power or you know I just raise an emotion and ordinary people they get an emotion and they start to believe these emotions so my question is how can this be stopped even the whole even if the whole state administration was appealing to rational thinking, w they will give rational information. But, f but simply, if you fail to appeal to emotions, if there's no emotional charge, how can you succeed? You know, I'm afraid this is not going to have an effect. Even though if we were doing this from, from morning to evening, you know, from dawn to dusk, You can't do this without it. It doesn't, it's not enough if ministries will do something or self-governments will do something, but we have information space where the government, for the benefit of its own information safety and security, is obliged to provide citizens with objective information. We can't ban or prohibit those who, who actually promote different narrative, because this is in, in, um, this goes against the freedom of speech, obviously, but two things, two key things that I personally haven't noticed, it's just my personal experience, it's th there's been a major shift. The information is uh, not about the rational message anymore, but the disinformation wave is raising emotions. It's, you know, the, the, the objective is to to raise negative emotions. So, so overall, there's no focus on emotions on our side. How are we actually going to do that? How are we actually going to, to, to ensure, because it's not enough to give rational arguments. Unless there's no emotions, we will be losing. We will be just be inefficient, because the debate is elsewhere. We are at a different level. I mean, we could be talking here at this forum all of us, we you know we are rational people. We we like the facts, but this is totally different de debate. Totally different debate. Ladies, anything about the DCA debate? Yeah, just one remark. I think, and it, it's been also repeated many times. Even though I should be talking about the EU, but also at the level of the EU, there's an effort, and I reflect this quite intensively that uh, we are, should be getting closer to the citizens. Let's bring them the topics that they understand. We, we need to explain them. But how do you explain bank union? How do you explain fiscal union? How do you explain DCA, which is pretty much a technical document only? I mean, you can't really simplify that. And as soon as you try to simplify it, you are getting into, you know, we, we are cornering ourselves and we can only be shouting and there's the only emotions we can put into it. So I personally don't think that we need mm, ex to explain everything for 
any uh, for any price at any price because not everyone will understand. I mean, I'm also not a football expert, so I won't comment football, and I'm not trying to understand football. So every everybody has opinion on everything here, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't mean that if uh, if you see something on social networks that you should respect everyone's opinion, you know, the silent majority is still here and it's very intensively present. So just a comment. Perhaps it's a bit out of control, but uh, when uh, you had the, the, the Ministry of Defense with DCA and there was interdepartmental commerce procedure, I mean, it was too silent. And we thought, all of us, you know, such an agreement, there's no, no debate, and then it started, right? So maybe the ministries could remain with their te technicalities, with their technical details when it's necessary, and not to launch into debates about concentration camps for unvaccinated people, really, you know, it's absurd, you know. Uh, State Secretary, we... What would be your essential lesson learned from this debate? Mm, and again, it's not about empty criticism, it's just about the lessons learned, because there's going to be more debates um, of various types, maybe about the advanced presence of NATO in maybe also in our territory. So what's your, what's your essential lesson learned from this debate we've had in the past weeks? Well, the colleagues have said a number of very important observations, and it's all true. You know, the essential lesson we learned, and I learned personally, is that the, there's no foreign politics and, and security consensus for the country. This is the lesson we've learned. Because whether we were quiet or not, well, yes, we could be discussing whether the communication strategy was right or it was wrong, but it's necessary to differentiate what we've heard. Communication strategy about this particular agreement, DCA, and the other thing is the whole context of strategic communication for the past two years of this government. And I totally agree here that we are not going to save something, uh, a single thing, if we have underestimated something uh, during the previous two years. This is just a matter of fact. And uh, what's important and what counts is that the lack of consensus uh, has its consequences. And I can speak on my behalf, but maybe of some of my colleagues, we haven't presumed or expected that some politicians will react the way they did. And the fact that uh, Mr. Fitzo, former Prime Minister, reacted in this way was not a great surprise. But uh, the fact that the political party, The Voice, uh, has decided to pursue this way, and it was just a matter of communication, not of conviction, that was a surprise to us. And I think this was a mistake for them, and it will bounce back onto them. And But that's their problem. But what it... Uh, it's the problem of the overall communication here is that the consensus is lacking and we need to opt for other communication tools and strategies. Uh, and uh, this is also connected to the fact uh, and to the uh, question how to communicate, how to communicate about topics that are basically boring, that people are not interested in this kind of a an agreement is of no interest to most of the public. Maybe this very one was interesting because it was an agreement with uh, the U.S., but uh, we have similar agreements, bilateral agreements with other uh, countries. But how to communicate those uh, facts that are not interesting for the public and you don't, you just want to communicate facts? If there is no consensus among politicians, uh, it's even more complicated. We have had individual voices, uh, but today politicians 
have found out, and this is a matter of fact, and this, is, this doesn't apply only to Slovakia, but uh, to um, many other countries, uh, but that uh, you can capitalize on emotions of your citizens. And they basically don't care what they say. The only thing that matters to them is that they get political support and constituency. And sometimes the politicians actually don't say something they are convinced about just in order to collect supporters. And this is very complicated. How we are going to communicate topics we thought had been already resolved that there is no need to communicate about them anymore. And this is a lesson to be learned not only uh, by our ministry, but the whole government. We need to revisit the basics and start communicate the basics to the people. Uh, because now anybody can write anything to Facebook knowing there are no sanctions. And until this situation prevails, we will face the situation of people disseminating lies and misinformation, and we will need to fight it. This is a very comprehensive thing, and this has to do with the action plan uh, against hybrid threats. And we need to take a comprehensive approach, uh, starting from elementary schools, uh, NGOs, civil society, and other organizations when we know that uh, in some cases, we know about some organizations that are funded in uh, from murky sources, and we need to look into that. And uh, we need to realize and we need to really uh, um, pay attention to the media coverage of important topics. I was very uh, uh, disappointed by the fact that how the public television covered the DCA. Mm. Um, they were justifying uh, their attitude by uh, argument that they just want to represent diversity of opinions, but this is not the case because you cannot uh, justify dissemination of lies by diversity of opinions because where else you should learn truth, the truth than in the public television or public media, and this is very important. So uh, we need to have a long-term strategy uh, and communication strategy. Also, those are comprehensive questions, and there are no easy answers to them. And we know this um, in the world that yearns for simple answers to complicated questions. And just a short comment. I've had uh, this feeling that there used to be a uh, foreign uh, policy consensus, but it's in a way it's a myth. Most of our the politicians are just uh, ordinary people, and the survey has showed that our affinity to NATO or the uh, EU is very utilitarian and shallow. And I think that the politicians uh, just represent the society and the public. And um, there has been a shallow consensus on uh, certain questions that were of importance. Um, Later on, I would like to uh, ask uh, the auditorium and, and those who follow us, 
And since this panel is uh, titled The Change in the Global Security Environment, my question is, what do you consider to be the biggest security challenge or problem for Slovakia from the global perspective? I know this is a very broad question, and probably you could write a thesis or a couple of theses on that, but try to squeeze it into couple of minutes uh, and give it a European perspective. I'm quite surprised that I haven't heard uh, this uh, so far today. And I was thinking about what the fellow panelists, fellow panelists will say on this topic. Uh, only uh, Madam President uh, touched upon that. And this is that if somebody believes that there is a bigger threat to anybody on this planet but the climate change, then that person is, a f is from a different galaxy. Mm, we definitely need to pay much more attention to this topic than anything else. And uh, the institution that is helping us is the European Union, the EU. When we realize that it is a symbol of many superpowers, the EU is definitely a symbol of fight against the climate crisis. When we look south, and I won't elaborate on that, if uh, temperature rises by 1.5 degree in Saheli, then the only uh, crops it will bring is terrorism or immigration. And this rings the bell in the security issue. Ar Arctic region mm, is uh, not a hot topic. Those are all topics that we somehow keep on uh, overlooking, but those are pressing issues. And uh, if we can't face them, this will knock us down. And the EU is trying to be active when I have mentioned this bipolar and multipolar uh, world. If the EU wants to be a leader, uh, it needs to be taken serious. And I come back to my point is that the European sovereignty in defense is the baseline also in this issue. Deputy Minister, what do you consider to be the biggest global challenges and the challenges for Slovakia in the defense arena? I totally agree. The climate crisis is uh, um, overlooked or downplayed in Slovakia. and Not enough attention is paid to it, uh, even though the government is trying to make certain steps, but only on general level. And I also think that at the European level, it should be more specific. When it comes to me, the biggest challenge is the overall transformation of the security environment uh, in the context of new tools and technologies related to defense and mm, protection. We have heard in the previous panels about the cyber threats, cyber security, AI. This opens up uh, so many possibilities. And unfortunately, we cannot hear the deputy minister for, OK? So, we, and we are not ready for many of those challenges, not only at the national level, but also, but neither at the EU level or the level of NATO. So that's why Slovakia should support potential centers of excellence that focus on this on those issues because we can't deal with this on the national level. We need to join forces. And this will definitely need adequate funds. So uh, how do you, Deputy Minister, um, 
or something um, has been alluded by the minister about how defense forces or military forces are getting ready for those challenges. Well, perhaps sub question or sub answer. To, well, NATO, NATO should be preparing and Slovakia as such should be also preparing. So this means investment into education for mostly and investment in other forms of educational institutions, etc., etc. When it comes to armed forces in particular, naturally uh, this must mean investment into staff, which is not so traditionally oriented on you know, technology or hardware or military procedures, but also oriented on capabilities of different type. And we also have the educational institution, the military academy of Slovak Republic, which is related to adjustment of educational procedures. And we have other, uh, you know, uh, partners, uh, educational partners, where we send our staff internationally. We have, uh, uh, for example, Center of Excellence for Space Policy in the French city of Toulouse, and this is just an example, right? And we discuss whether we should send a person there, whether we should invest in their education, etc., etc. You know, but you know, these are things that may may not bring effect in one year time or five years time. But I am convinced we need to be thinking much more. We need to think in the horizon of ten or fifteen years. You know, and thinking about the potential threats, but also potential opportunities in that horizon of fifteen years. Let's say, so. The reaction is not overnight, and the preparation doesn't take overnight, even for the climatic crisis, you know. We at the Ministry we approved some materials, and we continue in approving the materials which uh, were aimed at changing the infrastructure, changing the purchase of some commodities in line with the latest trends. But these are long-term things that exceed one election period, or they even exceed several election periods. Yeah, we'll probably need cyber nerds who, who also are able to able to <coughs> do these activities. So very quickly, the global threats for Slovakia. What are they? Well, I'll follow up to Lucia and the State Secretary said we need to start by building situational awareness. We need to really know that the climate or other security threats are security threats also for this country and there will be um, in the future so building situational awareness s thinking about uh, security threats from the nationwide perspective looking ahead and prediction and thinking uh, about future potential threats this is these are the foundations and then we can be talking about climate or other particular threats to our security mr dulaba I'm afraid that we are ourselves, we alone are our, our own biggest threat, security threat, because, but uh, I want to, I want to give you an example, you know, climate change, do, yes, can, can we manage this, do we know what we need to do, you know, energy crisis, prices go up, people are unhappy, people are frustrated, and now, do we actually have any solutions that are well thought up, that are sustainable? We know this is a problem, but are we able, are we prepared to get rid of our comfort or the luxury we've been living in, you know, our well-being? Uh, you know, are we able to do this? So we humans are our own security threat because, <clears throat> yes, we can all understand rationality, or all of us here at least, for that matter, but we have not enough resolve to change our way of life. And of course, then there are people who are not educated, but they are frustrated with COVID, with the rising prices of food and rising prices of, of fuels. And so they go up against the government. They go up against the EU, against NATO, against the establishment, because they don't think about it anymore. They just do it automatically from resent, from frustration. You know, they're just unhappy. So they protest anyone who is in power. Right. So it's a vicious circle. I could be talking about European security and what else we need to negotiate in our relationship to Russia. So I'll just end up here. We are our own biggest security threat. And with this, we will have to unfortunately also finish the debate here. I apologize for not having enough time for the questions.
questions from the audience, but I have a contact from the organizer. We will have to uh, end the panel right now. So I'd like to I'd like to tell you one more thing to conclude this. We certainly didn't address all the security threats. We've outlined some of them, but in many cases we've uh, at least gave you a f food for thought, maybe, to all of us, for that matter, who deal with this matters, whether it's uh, people from the academia, people from think tanks, people from the media, how to communicate these uh, topics and how to support open and free debate and not to be afraid to label something a lie or disinformation. Thank you very much for your attention. Apologies for not allowing questions from the audience. I'm sure this has been very insightful. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
Takže dobrý deň, do pekné popoludne, dámy a Pleasant afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin the third part of today's event of the review conference, placing emphasis on economic diplomacy and development cooperation as tools of Slovak foreign policy. The greatest challenge in the past two years, indeed, for all of us, and for the private sector, and for the public sector as well, notwithstanding the economic diplomacy and development cooperation, was naturally the pandemic. It was the pandemic that forced them essentially change their operation and activities such as uh, trade fairs, missions, presentations, and all of these things were either uh, closed down or shifted to the online environment and the primary focus was placed on uh, missions on provision of a helping hand to uh, businesses and mapping of new COVID measures and support of healthcare measures abroad. However, the pandemic also brought uh, opportunities, not only threats, opportunities in international cooperations in science, research and innovation, which is extremely important agenda for us as a country. And that goes hand in hand with economic diplomacy and development cooperation. So what were the impulses to increase the quality of performance of uh, economic diplomacy and development cooperation and how we can serve better our the clients, so companies and other stakeholders, and what are the expectations for the upcoming period? These are the topics for the third panel. Let me introduce the guests on my right-hand side. We have State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs, Ingrid Brodskova. Welcome. Next to her, we have Josef Viskupic, Chairman of the Ternava Self-Governing Region. Good afternoon. Next to Mr. Viskupic, we have uh, our single representative of the civic, as civic uh, sector, uh, Andrea Najvirtová, member of the Umbrella Bureau. Welcome, Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Najvirtová. Then we have uh, Alana Balogová, CEO of Chemosvit Fibrochem SRO. And last but not least, we have uh, Erwin Haramia. Chairman of the board of Aliter Technologies, company that we do not really need to introduce. Welcome. My name is Sonia Muzikarova. I'm a chief economist of Globsec Policy Institute here in Bratislava, and I'll be the moderator of today's panel. So let us start without any further ado. So we mentioned how the pandemics changed the operation of the resort of the, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of uh, economic diplomacy, etc. But no one has a better position to tell us how the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had to uh, improvise and to reinvent itself in this turbulent era. State Secretary, from your perspective, what were the biggest challenges uh, for your work in relation to the pandemic? And what were the new tools originating in relation to the pandemic and how you could review the last 12 to 24 years, this new tool set of instruments. State Secretary, thank you very much. Basically, I'm very happy that we have this review conference today. Is it, you know, it, it was uh, always an annual tradition and this year we are reviewing the past two years of uh, of uh, operation of the Foreign Service and its priorities. So in those past 24 months, what was framing all our activities in diplomacy was the pandemic, naturally. And the pandemic was um, truly affecting the Slovak economy. Essentially, it also represented a, an opportunity. It mobilized our forces, as you just outlined. During the pandemic, we <clears throat> so a great cooperation between the public and private sector. Simultaneously, Slovakia could present itself through innovative uh, solutions, uh, addressing the pandemic impact, and also our c the capacity of our science, of the academia, um, showed or turned out to be quite large, and how relevant they can become. And what we had to set quite 
quite quickly and and uh, promptly was the focus on the humanitarian aid and the development aid and uh, I was I was uh, glad to see that Slovakia could quickly address the impact of the pandemic uh, here in the, in the surrounding countries, including the countries of the member states, just like Italy, for example, or Romania, or countries of the Western Balkans. So a great package, a uh, great volume of humanitarian aid, not only material, but financial aid for a number of countries of the Western Balkans, including Serbia and Montenegro, Eastern Partnership countries like Georgia and Moldova. We were involved in a number of international initiatives, just like a Global Response Initiative and Team Lead. And we could even help our partnering countries with uh, vaccines, which was already mentioned. We, we provided 140,000 vaccines doses of vaccines uh, to countries like Rwanda, Kenya, uh, Ukraine, Montenegro, Armenia. We got involved in the COVAX system. So there was a, a, a huge number of activities that we very flexibly had to set to meet the needs of the countries that simply needed our assistance more than we needed assistance of someone else. So, mm, and we were thinking for these two years how to come up with a new offer of economic diplomacy and our engagement in uh, in a number of matters mm, because number of uh, number of people at home or abroad don't really associate the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with the economic diplomacy as such. So we were thinking about how to create a tool set of new instruments uh, in economic diplomacy, how to contribute to internationalization of SMEs that represent 99% of the economic structure of this country and how to open the door for them to be able to do business abroad, to offer opportunities for them because small medium sized enterprises account for 70% of the jobs and 55% uh, of that value so some of the formats had to be renewed for example, the format from the regions to the world is the name of the format. But we want to map out the potential of the Slovak businesses, map out the potential of the Slovak economy, and through our embassies and representations create opportunities abroad. We came up with the initiative titled Innovation Days. Let me just point out here that Slovakia is often an unknown country and these innovation days are a tool, basically a locals tool, because every month we visit with uh, the representatives accredited uh, in Slovakia, the innovative uh, Slovak companies that we want to present, that we want the foreign partners to know about. And we also organized last year the export forum for Slovak SMEs to be able to talk about their business and how to create a platform, how to help and support internationalization of Slovak SMEs. And in those two years, we reset the, the section of the strategic and economic cooperation, so the contact with the business community. And the second pillar was the shaping of policies and monitoring of uh, Slovakia's ranking. So basically it's a mirror of where Slovakia is found in the sector of policies. And I'm really glad that the section came with uh, two initiatives. One of them is Team Slovakia. This tries to network all public institutions that are involved in their activities in economic diplomacy and the corporate days initiatives where on a monthly basis the business center and other authorities are presenting our economic diplomats, our embassies, the potential of some companies and some sectors. Thank you very much. Okay, so this was rather a comprehensive 360 type of perspective, but what really resonated with me was the innovative potential. Slovakia is uh, 
not the stronghold of automotive industry anymore only, uh, but we have uh, many other things to offer. Slovakia was, uh, or many companies were expanding uh, abroad even during pandemic. So what is the uh, other pan I would like to ask Ms. Harami and uh, other panelists about the economic diplomacy. Have you managed to actually cover um, your activities um, and um, also promote uh, the brand Slovakia? Abroad. So I will start with Ms. Balogova, then Mr. Haramia. Hemosfit uh, Fibrofen is a company I represent, and the real uh, kind of uh, hands on experience with economic diplomacy in our company dates back two years ago. We started to work on innovations and specific products. So we as a company, as a mid-sized company, we did have an opportunity to travel to Dubai and also to uh, the business mission in Taiwan together with Ms. Kish. And we finally managed to meet with our clients because during the pandemics, uh, actually those uh, business meetings were very limited, um, the fairs were cancelled and we do have uh, quite a big potential in Taiwan for developing our uh, products. We export our products uh, to more than 40 countries of the world and we export 95% uh, of our products. Economic diplomacy is something that can help us promote the products in the markets but also uh, keep and preserve the potential and the market that we have and develop it further. When it comes to economic diplomacy, we have actually got experience and um, with the economic diplomacy and the export forum company days where I actually made a lecture in front of economic diplomats and I managed to present our new program that we were awarded uh, the prize of innovative um, deed of a year um, and we have just uh, finished testing in the in certain area in um, the surgery department and the textile materials uh, are passive disinfectants actually creating sterile environment uh, w uh, which in our uh, hospitals is absolutely inevitable to deploy. We were also part of the project uh, the export of regions uh, to the world uh, and I think this activity is postponed for April, but the representatives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs visited our company, um, pay, made a site visit, and we are very proud of uh, our production and we are very thankful to the Ministry of in, uh, Foreign Affairs and uh, European Affairs to present us in the world. Alita Technology has had extensive experience with economic diplomacy. Uh, our company is going to celebrate 15th anniversary this year. And since we are one of the first IT entities in Slovakia, or the very first that managed to sign a contract with the biggest NATO agency for communication and IT systems, so-called basic ordering agreement, that actually was assisted by that time economic diplomacy 
um, back then in Belgium with NATO and the EU. So thanks to our experience, and I don't want to um, sort of like uh, underline the importance of certain names here, but I uh, want to talk to general. So what is the, our experience with economic diplomacy? Briefly speaking, I would like to say that uh, we have positive experience with economic diplomacy, very good, and I do hope that also in the future we will keep on communicating and working together with the representatives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in different countries. I would like to bring attention to the latest experience in the field of basic ordering agreement where we won one fifty million tender and just immediately after that after um, being notified that we were a winner, then we found out that we were not a winner. And we, as a mid-size company in Slovakia, and also in the understanding of NATO, we didn't have the leverage to fight against this. And I would like to thank the representatives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense that they really helped us in this fight. They were brave and bold enough to uh, stood up for us. Unfortunately, we were not successful because there was no other chance but to start an arbitration process, but of course we highly appreciate NATO as an international organization and we would like to continue working with it. So naturally we decided not to initiate arbitration. But I just want to reiterate mm, the importance of economic diplomacy, and this was a fresh example of its importance. I'd like to thank to Miss Balogova. This is
trošku vysvetli, lebo, lebo tá rozvojová spolupráca je často vnímaná, že vy, čo tam robíte ďaleko v tých krajinách, však aj my máme dostatok problémov tu na Slovensku, na čo potrebujeme pomáhať niekde inde. Takže pre mňa sú to naozaj dve prepojené nádoby, že, že ten svet sa v posledných rokoch výrazne posunul, že už sa nedá deliť na zahraničie a doma tie globálne výzvy sa týkajú bezprostredne nás, nás všetkých. Zároveň rozvojová spolupráca pomáha dosahovať, prispievať k mieru, k bezpečnosti, znižovať extrémizmus. Taktiež prispieva k odstraňovaniu niektorých faktorov, ktoré nutia ľudí za migráciou. Pomáha zlepšovať fungovanie právneho štátu v chudobnejších krajinách, alebo aj zlepšovať ekonomický blahobyt, čo je zase potom zaujímavé aj pre tú ekonomickú diplomáciu. Takže ja to vidím ako prepojené a zároveň oddelené, oddelené nádoby. A ako organizácie sa venujeme teda pomoci v krajinách, kde pretrvávajú ekonomická kríza, vojnový konflikt, ktoré boli postihnuté krízou. A do toho prišla teda pandémia, ktorá tieto rozdiely ešte viacej prehlobila. A, a ako organizácie sme sa venovali zabezpečeniu zdravotnej starostlivosti, prístupu k vode, pokračovaniu vzdelávania. A, a v tomto vlastne aj zdieľame spoločný cieľ s Ministerstvom zahraničných vecí, ktoré má ako úlohu naplňať aj ten záväzok, ktorý ako Slovensko máme, ako aktér globálneho spoločenstva prispievať uh, k rozvoju a k cieľom udržateľného rozvoja. Um, s príchodom pandémie musím povedať, že uh, veľmi pozitívne hodnotíme, uh, ako ministerstvo dokázalo rýchlo zareagovať. Uh, to, to fungovanie m, sa nedalo hneď tak preklopiť, že, 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 že niektoré veci sa dali preklopiť do online, niektoré veci vyžadovali flexibilnejší prístup, takže si veľmi oceňujeme aj tú flexibilitu zo strany Slovenskej agentúry pre medzinárodný rozvoj. A, a taktiež vítame, a, že bola vyhlásená výzva na, na boj s pandémiou, ktorá bol, bola veľmi rýchlo administrovaná, takže toto je aj výborný posun do budúcna, ak budeme potrebovať rýchlo reagovať na, na novozniknuté krízy, tak máme vyskúšaný nástroj, kde sa dá rýchlejšie zareagovať. To, čo možno trošku ovplyvnila negatív... What the pandemic influenced negatively is that in 2020 there was a planned implementation of a new development tool instrument, which was a longer term project, a three year project, where <laughs> of framework agreement, where we could go deeper, we could increase the um, impact compared to brief one or two year projects and unfortunately this was cancelled and also some resources which were originally aimed uh, at fighting poverty, fighting structural barriers, uh, causing poverty, these were redirected to fight against the pandemic and these resources will be missing where they are so needed. Thank you, we'll get to that. I'm sure that the State Secretary will have something to say, but before we get there, let me ask Mr. Viskupic. We've heard that the economic diplomacy and development cooperation have uh, synergy effects. So let me ask you, Mr. Viskupic, how do these two domains assist in developing regions and does the foreign ministry um, 
does it correctly, you know, these uh, initiatives like regions to the world, etc., etc. How does that work for you? Well, it's going to be a brief answer. Good afternoon, by the way. Yes, it does help, and it does help quite significantly. Just for those four years, I've been um, chairman of the uh, self-government region, so I've actually experienced four prime ministers, but there's a great degree of stability in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <coughs> and those who are in this room, and those who perhaps follow this uh, this um, topic, the performance of foreign service and the, the overall the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs has staff which is very, very uh, competent and very skilled, and I'm representing all eight regions, not only the Ternava self-governing regions here. Let me start with a, a leeway. I'm extremely glad that after this minister took charge, we boosted and advanced, especially the area that you started with. And here I'll follow up on uh, the state secretary where she finished. And this means the, the, the formation of unique tools to support some activities which the self-government regions are able to authentically deploy and use at a different level, especially in uh, the search and identification of assistance in how especially small and medium-sized enterprises are formatted, how these enterprises can get assistance and how they can you know, go abroad and you know, go into the world, so to say, metaphorically. You know, <coughs> this ministry and the minister uh, obviously is focusing on uh, European affairs and foreign affairs, but with our forces we can do a lot of European affairs, we can deal with a lot of European affairs, even as self-government regions, and <coughs> the point I'm trying to make is that right after this uh, minister took over charge and the state secretary met with us at several appointments and the minister as well d discussing how we can activate and reinvigorate uh, economic diplomacy and we found the tool and we agreed that let's reinvent ourselves in the regions and this led to several rounds of consultancies talking about which companies will be uh, addressed or approached which raster will be used what will this activity actually mean in those particular regions? Um, we even uh, set a time frame at the ministry. I think it was uh, two and a half days in every region for, and to, to link the stakeholders of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and self-governments, even with the lower level, that means uh, cities, towns and uh, communities, and the companies active in their very specific environments, in their regions. And the second thing that I really, really appreciate is Innovative Day or Innovation Day, name of the event, which introduces the region and the, the companies uh, operating in the region to other countries uh, through the representatives of the representative through the representatives of the region and the country. I believe this was one of the most robust robust activities uh, that promoted Slovak regions abroad. Again, it's a new tool that we very much appreciate. And I have one specific uh, result of this uh, activity, this Innovation Day. You may have noticed that one Slovak product manufactured in the town of Senica uh, was, you know, is now her parents are from Belgium and Britain, but nevertheless she lives uh, in uh, the town of Senica and the, and the company mm, coming from the town of Senica is uh, manufacturing this unique model, this unique business plan. And the, well, the product very far across, not just the border of the district, of the, of the, of the region, but of the country, and now we have specific, well, almost almost tangible results. So, in other words, it does make sense, even from the regional level, we can cooperate with the, you know, uh, the Ministry of uh, European Foreign Affairs. We can act uh, uh, and promote the, 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 the regions and the companies doing business in the region. 
I don't think that we've discussed with the ministry, and I believe that this there is a lot of base improvements there, and that's the you know self-governed regions with these two power diplomacy dimensions. So we are also you know active in our own using our own resources in uh, in Brussels. So we have this European-wide instru uh, instrument available. And also, based on our own forces, the regions have this cross-border um, cooperation or bilateral cooperation with some other regions in other countries. I believe that this initiative, S SK8, that is, that is um, involving eight self-government regions of the Slovak Republic, uh, could give you know some sort of roof overarching the ad hoc cooperation of between these eight regions. And I have to say that the ministry has always been very willing to give us a helping hand. And I actually think this could become a systematic tool, one of these tools in the tool set, which would make us more successful as, as, as uh, regions of the V4 uh, countries. And when there's a professional and good cooperation in this field, I'm sure we could compete even regionally with other you know, regions across the whole EU and also globally. Thank you. So now uh, let me ask the audience here in the room and uh, audience outside the room, the virtual audience, if you know what I mean, uh, to start thinking about uh, questions uh, for our third panel and the panelists or comments if you like. But now let me return back to you, State Secretary. In those past years you've been quite successful, you've achieved a lot, you reacted to the pandemics, you've implemented new tools, new started new events, we've just heard. You've presented Slovakia as a brand in the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates in uh, Dubai. But there's one phrase that you keep saying, uh, sticks to my mind. You say the economic diplomacy is done at home. This sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, or at least it sounds non-intuitive. You know, we're talking about supporting of export. We're talking about foreign partners. We're talking about foreign expansion. So could you sort of uh, elaborate on this? What do you actually mean by this phrase? And what, what actually is the overall concept of the economic diplomacy? Because you said every diplomat is an economic diplomat. So this perhaps relates to that. And I have a second question as well. What is the biggest hurdle biggest barrier in achieving the objectives of economic diplomacy and development cooperation. What what keeps you awake at night? Well, what keeps me awake at night is the conflict at the Russian-Ukrainian border. But first of all, first thing first, you know, let me thank you for your kind words, uh, because this is a reward for the whole team at the Ministry of Foreign European Affairs, not just me or the minister. So big thanks to you, especially uh, the activity labeled from the regions to the world, because uh, the chairman here spends two full days with us. And these are all activities that, you know, teach us as well. Behind all these companies, there are beautiful stories, there are beautiful people. And it's a mutual learning process for both, both parts. And it's exciting. Now the economic diplomacy mantras. The one of these two mantras truly is, just like foreign policy starts at home, economic diplomacy also starts at home. And in economic diplomacy you can only have such strength, uh, you, you can only be as strong as, uh, as competitive are your home companies. In other words, you need to have productive, competitive, and strong companies at home, and then only then you can be a strong economic diplomat, you know. So in this respect, so Slovakia so certainly does have potential, but we need to make attempts for this uh, for this uh, strength is even greater, so that we have more strong, competitive, and successful companies. And the second mantra, yes, every diplomat is an economic diplomat, indeed. Uh, we have a relatively wide network of uh, representations and embassies abroad. 
However, the staffing at these embassies is relatively low. We have few people there, so it would be a luxury if I said that we have uh, uh, diplomats mm, in a small, you know, representations should be specializing in some particular area or some particular policy. So every single diplomat is also an economic diplomat. And we are only calling for more understanding when we are communicating with the private sector at the national level. Please give us specific expectations and specific requirements because the more specific the requirement for economic diplomacy activities, the more specific, the more efficient, the more high performing we can be uh, offering you specific uh, diplomats and spe uh, offering specific assistance. Second very important matter is the communication and synergy at national level because we as the ministry responsible for economic diplomacy we are forced to cooperate in economic diplomacy as well and uh, cooperation and communication of all stakeholders is highly important and that's why I so much appreciate the shaping of the Team Slovakia where on the monthly basis all the institutions involved in economic diplomacy are communicating and negotiating and the second framework that we are shaping and that we want to um, create is uh, the concept the concept of uh, external economic relations and econ economic diplomacy with the Ministry of Economy and the government um, council for competitiveness and productivity and this should be uh, a platform for better cooperation, better networking, better sharing of information etc. because the engagement in the, the engagement abroad is not only with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I want to confirm that yes we are asking other ministries to join us because some territories in some parts of the world literally require stress on the sectoral policy, whether it's innovation diplomacy, whether it's development of relations with the agricultural uh, sector or educational sector. So yes, we want, as a ministry, we want to be more open to cooperation with other ministries, other agendas, to call on them to send their representatives, their experts, who would then be active in our representations and embassies dealing with specific assignments. Thank you very much. Uh, there's been a resonating uh, importance of macroeconomic environment, business environment and uh, the performance of economic diplomacy is related to that. So let me ask you, Mr. Viskupic, we've been uh, worrying, we've been concerned with convergence of the regions for many years. Has, oh, would convergence of regions and coherence of uh, economic performance of the Slovak Republic also economic diplomacy? Well, I'm, I mean, is it a two-way street, you know? Uh, on the one hand, economic diplomacy helping the regions, but could this also be other way around? If the regions were more, co more, more coherent, would this help the, the support the performance of economic diplomacy? What do you think? It is such a broad contextual question, almost as this room and our maneuvering space as the region is of the size of the stage. Well, some would say that we are making lame excuses. Uh, and we are trying to blame the competency framework. But if we managed to perform a significant reform of the self-governing system and the regions would get more competencies, that would be a m very efficient change. And what you are asking about when it comes to our regional competencies uh, they don't include those things. There are financial legislative tools and for 
the past 20 years, those competencies remain at the central level. And I actually wanted to thank you that for the first time in the history of the review conference, you have the representation of regions. We are celebrating 20 years of existence in Slovakia. Your conference has been around for the past 20 years as well, so the time is high that after those two decades of our functional period, we could uh, um, do the, we could make the um, check. The cooperation is really built on the personal involvement of each and every stakeholder. And if somebody wants to produce better instruments of uh, economic diplomacy and it is his or her political mandate, then they will achieve it. And I believe that's, that this institutional roadshow would really have stronger uh, reputation and would be a str would have stronger leverage for uh, supporting business at the regional level. I believe that the wrong setup of competencies is uh, kind of a reflection of the past 30 years of how the public policies have been built, and I do think that the reform of public administration is a central task. This government is not going to make it. We need to be open about it. And so any government that uh, will follow should focus on better division of competencies. Decentralization and modernization of public administration is kind of a buzzword. And I would like this to buzzword to transform into reality with better financial coverage um, instruments for the benefit of better business environment. And we definitely have better overview of what is happening in our region than the central government. So we are better when it comes to setting the rules for the benefit of business environment and economic activities in our region. So I wanted to really avoid any, any ally by seeking and I want to be optimistic. And when it comes to reform of the competencies from the trajectory of from the business to the national level, we really need to take comprehensive approach, whether we will have not three, not two regional structuring, whether there will be any type of municipalization and uh, developing the strong uh, partner. I hope that we will find answers to this. and. This can result into eye to eye partnership uh, relation. Two partners of, uh, from working in the field of economic diplomacy, and we could take example from Austria, Niederösterreich, well, with uh, other units. So, thank you. So, the baseline premise for efficient economic diplomacy is that it needs to work with the companies with good ideas, good implementation, and that are competitive with high level of productivity, and they operate in the international market. And I'd like to talk to the representatives of the businesses, Mr. Bal uh, Mr. Haramia and Ms. Balogova. So what is your perspective? What are the biggest obstacles from your perspective when it comes to the business environment, getting talents or anything else, what would 
make you more competitive, uh, more efficient, and if not in the context of your organization, then what do you see around your competi competitors or what would you need in order to pursue this goal? Mr. Haramia? I fully support uh, the words of the State Secretary who has said that uh, economic diplomacy without functional businesses cannot do anything for us. And if there is not a good idea or a good product or a good system to be talking uh, from the world of uh, IT, then it's pointless to open the door for us. It's pointless for any economic diplomat to be on the other side of the table. We can't make a step. We can't progress. So the first prerequisite is to have something to offer. And of course, if, if there is nothing to offer, then we <laughs> shouldn't go to the international market. But, um, but fortunately, this is not our case. And I would like to detour to the arena arena of the security and defense industry and I'm the chairperson of this association and I would like to mm, draw on the experience of our association and of its members and they often complain and not to be only very positive and praising They often say that, for instance, the, the defense companies face problems and are struggling with import and export licenses. And I don't want to praise or blame anybody. Fortunately, I'm not talking about our business because we don't do business with those communities. Alitech Technologies supplies and develops ICT, although for special users as military and defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Interior of different countries, not only Slovakia, but also neighboring countries, as I've already mentioned. especially North Atlantic um, Treaty Organization and the EU. I'd like to follow up on the State Secretary. She has mentioned that cross-sectoral cooperation should be enhanced and uh, our experience is that the Exim Banka works on its own, Sario works on its own, economic diplomacy uh, sort of like operates on its own, and there is no kind of interconnectivity. Um, you know, we need one point, starting from the taxes, customs, and anything and everything related to this arena be it from the area of the Minister of Economy or Minister of Foreign Affairs. So this is something we should pursue. We should uh, connect uh, the platforms, institutions, because we uh, intensively cooperate with Exim Bank and also economic diplomats and Sario. And what happens to us quite often is that they just don't communicate among each other and they don't know what they do actually about each other. And often, 
economic diplomats or those institutions do not have uh, access to export and import export data sorry and uh, data from customs are not uh, is not available to certain segments which is strange because if you are supposed to manage export and you should assist in certain markets or if you are an economic diplomat in Sri Lanka and it, uh, he or she doesn't know that uh, we export three to four containers to Sri Lanka uh, a month, then it's very difficult for him or her to help us to identify a fare uh, or get the contacts to the um, Chamber of Commerce that exists there since we export into many countries and we are trying to find contacts to uh, business chambers. We um, participated in fairs of Shanghai, Uzbekistan and the uh, ambassador there was of great help there and we tried to promote our products in this way. And what often happens to us is that many times the economic diplomats don't even know about affairs. And the information from Sario is not linked to other mm, institutions or business entities or they uh, choose uh, affairs that are not relevant for the Slovak uh, business sector. And another, uh, the second problem is the lack of qualified labor and also a link or connectivity of the Ministry of Education to the needs of the businesses because uh, uh, the elementary and high schools do not actually reflect on the needs of the business. Because when we look at the territorial export structure, you know where the exporters are, what makes them competitive uh, in the foreign markets. And here, it seems that the other ministries fail to reflect where we need assistance, where you need to change the curricula. You know, you know in the town of Sweet, we have three textile companies. We have a chemical producer, we have foil producer, and the, and the subjects are biopharma psychologist, uh, worker in logistics, you know, there are no subjects reflecting the actual companies in the region or in the city. So this is perhaps the, the call for cooperation and to do something about the segmentation of um, exports and the, do something about the educational sector and the research agency should also cooperate more and Economic diplomacy should be focusing more on EU funds, uh, research and development and innovation uh, in Green Deal uh, within the scope of circularity, you know, and you should set the economic conditions, the, the you know, the business missions and economic missions f uh, should be set directly through the research agency. Misco Mr. Biskupic, you want to react? Well, this may sound like a direct call on the Ministry of Education, but I guess you know that this is pretty much the responsibility of the of self-governed region and the chairman of the self-governed region, which is creating this document called the Plan of Performances, where also is a chapter dedicated to respective subjects of uh, secondary schools. And I can tell you this is a topic for conference in itself. So even though this is the conference of uh, the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs and European Affairs, but how to align the ideas of parents, of students, and the needs of the labor market. I mean, if anyone solves this Gordian knot, will certainly receive some sort of local version of Nobel Prize because this is uh, an issue for not only Slovakia, not only for Europe, but this is a global problem. Um, and I agree with you that this is something that needs to be done and it's a problem that needs to be tackled, but I wouldn't really blame the Ministry of Education because it's pretty much 30-30-30, you know, the, the sector 
then the the regions and a little bit of the ministry as well you know creating curricula in uh, in the, our region we actually put together the list of uh, desired subjects you know uh, sometimes it's difficult to fulfill it because you can't really force the students to study this or that subject you can't force them to regard this uh, sound career for the future right just to explain but I'm not disagreeing and also under the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs we can use dual education or the support of this uh, subjects in demand we even actually uh, allow the students to be able to, to, to earn some money during the studies so that we help also our exporters. Thank you very much, Mr. Viskupic. Now, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Naivirtova uh, with the same question. What are the key challenges and barriers that you perceive through the prism of development cooperation in achieving the objectives of your organization? Well, one of the barriers which already has been mentioned is is this status quo of the civic of the civic society and one can feel this I'm quite happy that also mm, as a result of uh, an initiative by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there's this big cooperation project with the civic society which is among the priorities for the Biden's summit for democracy so I'm really glad that it's been uh, reflected as one of the priorities and the roundtables under the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs which poignantly show that the civic society in Slovakia is uh, in a dire situation the models of funding are not sustainable the dialogue is not working as uh, it perhaps should be uh, the support is missing basically and the, the there is dominant vision uh, by the society of the civil civil sector as you know these volunteers doing things for free in their leisure time but there's a lot of experts in the sector who don't do this in their leisure time. It is their professional core uh, employment, so to say. Mm, so this is also the reason why this question of funding is so important. Also, a number of our members are also members of European networks. And we perceive and see how development cooperation, humanitarian aid is uh, working in a European degree or European sort of uh, measure and we need to be honest uh, we are not at the same level as uh, development cooperation in uh, other new EU member states if we compare ourselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis or eye to eye mm. And this is obviously not only the responsibility of the ministry or civil sector organizations, also the <coughs> perception of the public. You know, we all have some role to fulfill, some task to fulfill. NGOs will have to take the responsibility to take advantage or leverage their experience uh, with uh, humanitarian aid or provision of humanitarian aid provision of uh, development cooperation uh, we are helping to the Ministry of Education to reflect the values that we are talking about into the educational process we can flexibly react we can mobilize resources even from the public I'm excited and glad that the trend of supporting these cases by the public financially is, is uh, rising we can support and promote the brand of Slovak aid also abroad 
and we are basically a, an instrument of Slovak solidarity around the world. What would help us? Well, there are three areas. First of them is more predictable and long-term financing so that we can all go more in depth, measure the impact of our work and have better arguments why this development cooperation is so important. And it makes me glad that the Slovak Agency for International Development Cooperation is now launching bigger projects, whether it is the Delegated Cooperation Project of the EU in Moldova, or hopefully this year we'll launch this framework cooperation of strategic partnership. So these longer term, larger projects are an important step to advance qualitatively. The second point of three, the volume of developed cooperation and humanitarian aid. That is lower in the long term than the commitment to which we officially obliged. The commitment is 0.33% of GDP. For 2020 it was 0.14 uh, GDP. And yes, I uh, realize it's, uh, it's not only about this big volume of money, but it's about being able to go in depth and being able to to perform more concentrated interventions because it's a different thing if you perform one 100,000 budget project in a country or you help this country with a half a million budget. You know. And then of course the impact and the relations with the partnership country, that's, that's a different story. And the third aspect of three, when we compare the tools uh, summer's tools with the European tools or the tools by other donors, we perceive that it would be really helpful if these tools were more flexible, if the administrative burden was more limited or smaller. And this could help also the objectives of the ministry, and that is involvement of uh, businesses in development cooperation. So these are the three suggestions from our part. Thank you very much for these specific suggestions. State Secretary was making notes, so taking notes. So I'm sure this will be this will be uh, useful. We have last four minutes of the panel. I don't know. I haven't noticed too many questions in sliders. So one of the questions is, is where is the minister? So. Don't worry, Minister will be here soon, but in the meantime, let me ask the uh, audience in the room here. Mr. Matyshak, you have a question? Perhaps you will need a microphone. Thank you. It's a question specifically to the State Secretary, or uh, if anyone wishes to comment, of course. Maybe Ms. Neuwirtova as well. Would you say that, um, well, I'm still, you know, concerned with the Ukrainian topic. You know, I was teasing the Minister of Defense and the State Secretary a little uh, how we are going to help, actually. So uh, can you, we finally say something specific? But, okay, I'm not asking you to say anything really specific, but maybe in terms of development cooperation or economic cooperation, what does Ukraine mean to us? How? we can help in this sector so that Ukraine is more politically resilient, politically more stable and therefore more, you know, linked and associated to our Euro-Atlantic or transatlantic uh, uh, area, which I believe is the objective or one of the objectives of our, uh, our foreign policy. So what's your plans for economic diplomacy in Ukraine? Thank you very much. and. Uh, Perhaps I will ask the, the gentleman here at the beginning of the, uh, at the front room to ask another question so that we can take them both. Thank you. My name is Burash. I'm the advisor to the Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic for cross-border cooperation in Ukraine. And for 15 years I've been closely 
linked to Ukraine because I often travel. I live in Kosice and I often travel to Užhorod from Kosice, so I will be certainly talk about the positive news to our cross Carpathian partners and friends because they are really, really waiting uh, eagerly to hear the news from the other sides of the Carpathians because the Slovak Republic is helping and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is helping to our Ukrainian friends and let me just uh, give you the news from the most recent uh, negotiation with the General Consulate of the Slovak Republic where we uh, negotiate with the Ivano-Frankovsk area in, um, in uh, Western Ukraine. I need to emphasize that the government of the Slovak Republic on the 12th January this year at its session approved the decree number 17 which says about the new form of cooperation between the Slovak Republic and Ukraine, this material was proposed or submitted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It contains eight chapters and says how Slovak Republic can help Ukraine. And one of these points is also integrated border and cross-border cooperation, which links to um, preparation of ESUS, the tool for regional development, for drawing of funds that Slovak Republic could not draw previously because this tool was not operational, not implemented. I had the negotiations with Mr. Sadko from the consulate in the Ukrainian city of Lvov and the Ivano-Frankovsk uh, region and there was just this incident with the Ukrainian flag happening in the Slovak parliament and you know what they told us? They told us that thanks God that you are here because this is cooperation for us. This is what really matters. This is what Slovak Republic is d giving to us. This is what we expect from you. And what would be nice to have is if there was this representation for um, travel industry, because I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but Slovak Republic until 2017, there was, you know, uh, such a Slovak tourist board. Slovak tourist board had representations in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Austria, Germany, and Russian Federation. And under Russian Federation, there was also Ukraine. So when Slovak Republic was presented as country, then you had a, a person traveling from Moscow, Moscow, Moscow to Ukraine. So you can imagine what was their perception. You know, I know that we have strong economic diplomacy. Ms. Krajčová at the, the Slovak embassy in Kiev. But maybe a wish or a plea, that would be a signal from our part also for the diplomacy and for the businesses, for the self-governments, is it doesn't cost too much. Just consider creating such center, such place. There would be a direct proof of support by Slovak Republic to Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We actually uh, are running late, but I do hope uh, that we will get some extra time for uh, reaction for reaction uh, by the State Secretary. Uh, I believe that um, uh, we have covered most of it. Uh, Ukraine is our neighbor. Uh, our political representatives have been actively uh, working on opening dialogue and promoting our cooperation. We have tri uh, this has been the case also in the past uh, for the four region. Uh, our priority in terms of V4 was renewables and energy sector and the experience of our companies that could be of inspiration to Ukrainian businesses uh, are different. Uh, uh, we need to realize that the Ukraine has been in war for to, uh, f uh, since 2014. There's a strong push for reforms in Ukraine, but this country is at war. And yes, uh, when it comes to travel, we want to open up to the Slovakia Travel Agency, and currently we are negotiating with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Transportation how to set it up so that the travel delegates uh, are member of the Slovak team working in a given uh, country while respecting certain diplomatic uh, rules. Thank you very much. And I don't think there is uh, time for any closing remarks. I would like to thank the panelists uh, for a very inspirational debate and uh, 
uh, auditorium for their questions, and I'm very much looking forward to the next year of the review conference. Thank you very much.
Sadnime si. Tak ja vás vítam v rámci... I'd like to welcome you at the final panel of our review conference and I'm very glad that uh, we do have a host of uh, our conference, uh, the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs, Mr. Korczok, and I'm glad that together with him we can wrap up the basic and primary topics of our conference, the change in the global security situation, tension at the Russian-Ukrainian border, but at the same time we were talking a lot about the need to, to structure a new communication of uh, foreign and EU policy topics uh, with our public that would reflect the need to fight uh, fake news that keep on growing in our public arena, and that actually um, contribute to very twisted perception of our foreign and European policy minister. I would like to ask you for an opening or introductory speech or notes. Uh, well, we are not starting really good here, but uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I address you uh, because uh, originally it was planned that I would have a speech, uh, but we need to reschedule. And okay, so a couple of remarks, and then uh, you, uh, I will be grilled, or I will get questions later on. Before I focus on the foreign and European policy, let me share another piece of sad news. After last week's uh, death of Mr. Kukan, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, we uh, unfortunately are facing another sad piece of news. Uh, Mr. Radoslav Bohac, uh, diplomat, uh, has uh, passed away today. We have known him for years. Uh, Rado has, um, or Rado devoted all of uh, his life to diplomacy and he died uh, performing diplomacy at OECD in Vienna and let me ask you to or let uh, me express uh, our condolences to uh, his wife and let me ask you please to stand up. Thank you very much. I apologize ahead if you can uh, witness the collapse of my voice. Uh, that's due to COVID I have just uh, gone through. Okay, this is a very exceptional review conference uh, because uh, we cover past two years uh, and I have a wrap up of uh, what I wanted to say and I, um, I see that Eva as a moderator has a very fierce grip of this panel so I really cannot dive into what I wanted to say originally, but still, let me let me really mm, 
touch upon the five main areas of uh, my interest. Uh, the first area is uh, I labeled it us and the pandemics, and it goes far beyond um, the health issue or public health uh, as such. Uh, it goes uh, to the global scene. Uh, of course, uh, first uh, we needed to really uh, learn how to how to deal with the situation, uh, repatriation. We were um, trying to rescue Schengen, uh, free movement of citizens. In the second stage, uh, we focused on consolidation. That means we wanted to secure vaccination and inoculation substances and uh, re reconciliation or, or um, Settling the situation also includes uh, the quantity of vaccines. We have a sufficient number of vaccines, but unfortunately we do not have uh, enough citizens that want to get vaccinated. Uh, still we need to be, we express, uh, we need to express cohesion and um, share the vaccines we have available. And uh, we are sending more than 200,000 vaccines to Palestine. And this is uh, that fits under the label us and pandemics and foreign policy. Of course, there are other things uh, that are happening. And it's far too early to, to um, kind of make an assessment what kind of an impact the pandemics has on transition of our economies, societies, uh, as such. We see that the character of uh, labor market is uh, changing, perception of education, social welfare, the type of business that is done, uh, supply chains are changing and reshuffling because they are under pressure. And uh, this goes hand in hand with uh, yet another big challenge. This is green transition that will principally change the character of global economy. The second uh, area or the second uh, area of interest is the fact that we are amidst the big megatrends. And we are dealing with our little business in here in Slovakia, but we are part of megatrends. Uh, everything um, really focuses on uh, Ukraine in recent days, but uh, India and Pacific region is becoming uh, uh, very important, and there is shift of direct competition and the struggle or the fight to Western Pacific. And this is very virtual topic in Slovakia so far. People are not interested, they don't realize this trend. Uh, next, uh, if uh, we want to talk about global security, and uh, Russia wants to talk about global security in general, and it really tries to detour the U.S. and Europe, uh, then uh, China can do it as the next uh, country. So that's why uh, NATO and transatlantic treaty is incredibly important. And uh, we also need to remind ourselves uh, that with the exception of past 40 years, Slovakia used and has to has been part of Western um, countries and Western uh, social structures, and we shall not challenge it. We also need to realize that Slovakia really suffers and sees as a problem the global lagging behind of the European Union in many areas. The EU is still one of the biggest economies in the world. We are the biggest the world donor, the most important standard setter, but the voice of the EU is uh, really uh, not easy to be heard. And this is not, uh, it's not my intention to criticize the EU. 
which is so typical for Central Europe. Uh, but we need to move towards consolidation of the EU. We need to settle with many unfinished things that are legacy from previous times, and we need to look throughout our conference into what needs to be done in the future. When it comes to megatrends, the population of the EU should, in 2050, have only 43, represent 43% uh, of the global population. We still feel, um, as uh, in the center of universe and the center of happening, but, uh, sorry, not 43, but 4.3% of global population in 2050. From the perspective of the global GDP, uh, where when we were on the first place, uh, first rank in 1990s, we will f fall down to the fourth place, representing 11.3% EU share on the global GDP. We need to see all those facts and trends also in Slovakia, and we should really uh, stop mystifying uh, the foreign trends and we should start focusing on real challenges for Europe because they are challenges for Slovakia and it, we, it is high time to understand that nationalization of Europe that is expressed in slogan the least of Europe or the politi politics of Slovakia as kind of a bridge is not going to empower Slovakia, but really debilitates it significantly. And the third area, us and protection of uh, human rights and democracy. I want to say that in our foreign policy, especially when it concerns the uh, agenda of human rights and rule of law, we see it as one of our priorities, because if we want to be consistent, that we consider the protection of uh, rule of law and human rights to be of importance, and I'm saying it uh, knowing that the opposition parties are criticizing us heavily for it. In spite of that, I see it as an integral part of our foreign policy, and we are really striving to promote those also towards our External partners, uh, 2020 was the 15th year in sequence where the global freedom was uh, dropping. So there were more countries with a worsened situation than improved situation. And of course, the pandemic uh, played a role. We approved the concept of uh, support of uh, human rights. Peter Burian was appointed as an envoy for human rights. There was a very a successful conference on human rights and democracy, and we are active participant in the Summit for Democracy. And talking about the human rights as uh, part of uh, foreign policy, this is not about ideological zealousy. It's not my motivation. Uh, we are kind of like criticized for being zealots in the area of human rights, but we are convinced that the better, there's better uh, governance of Slovakia and there's better situation in democracy and uh, good, well-governed uh, liberal democracy um, uh, really soothes conflicts and uh, upholding human rights is extremely important. Our uh, democracy is really the regime that allows us uh, to protect human rights the best. Uh, I have been criticized for uh, commenting on Belarus or other countries. Why? As if we want to dictate them how they should live. We don't want to dictate the Belarus. Uh, Rus, uh, Russia, how how to live? We don't want to dictate them what kind of regime they should uh, they should have. But we believe that in our immediate vis uh, 
vicinity is very bizarre if hundreds of people, including civil activists and journalists, are in prison because they just want to freely express their opinion how should things be governed. And the fourth area is um, I've been a Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in two years for the second time, and I'm saying that the foreign policy actually starts in our, with our neighbors. You may have the idea how things should work on the global level, but if you have problems with your neighbors, then you are really in a difficult situation. Therefore, we have been trying, and I have been trying to intensify bilateral relations with Ukraine, and I want to openly uh, underline the importance of the involvement of the Prime Minister, of our Prime Minister, and he made it his own political agenda, and I fully support it, because it's also in our interest. It's about uh, Ukraine remaining to, uh, as a sovereign state, or whether it will suffer from the war, whether it will thrive and flourish, and therefore we would really benefit from um, Ukraine flourishing. The same applies, for instance, to Austro-Slovak relations, also the, the border area of Austria is flourishing due to the improved situation in the um, border uh, lands of Slovakia. The same applies to Slovak-Hungarian relations, and I'm not going to dive into it, but I just want to reiterate that this is my mental or subjective uh, kind of position. If there is a problem, we need to discuss it. And I really don't think that uh, you should overlook or just to take notice about uh, um, growing problem. And the problem with uh, Hungary or the situation with um, the with Hungary was such. Uh, the the problem was big. Uh, the there was just this general statement that the relations are really good, and that was it. But I don't consider it to be a responsible and accountable approach. That due to the fact that the relations are good, we will be silent. This is not sustainable. The only sustainable setup is. If Hungarian or Slovak says, okay, there is a problem, we need to talk about it. We are partners, eye to eye. And this has been my principal approach, to always say openly where the problem lies or where there's uh, something challenging. And when talking about the relations with neighbors, of course, we are trying to establish very intense uh, relations with Poland, the Czech Republic, Austria, and, of course, in the Slavkov format as well. And, of course, we are going to do anything and everything for a very good presidency in the V4 um, format. And the uh, last uh, topic, uh, us and foreign, Slovak foreign policy. Principally, I could be happy that the foreign policy has been a dominating topic uh, in the past few weeks, because this is not usually the case. The foreign policy is uh, usually on the verge of the political and the social interest. And I actually said that this principal debate we had just entered into is going to uh, was going to continue but that's where my joy stops the last week's parliamentary debate was absolutely unacceptable it was uh, vulgar but the form uh, is secondary the most concerning part 
is the content or, or was the content of this discussion comparing uh, the promotion of our uh, cooperation um, uh, and uh, the, uh, also the agreement with the U.S. Uh, to the invasion uh, uh, by the Soviets was absolutely acceptable and also the second point in the discussion that concerned Ukraine was absolutely unacceptable as well. Those two extremes point to two serious problems, uh, the loss of historical memory and also uh, um, a mistake or the breach or uh, the problem in the compass and also the willingness to resign on the on our future direction. This is a discussion a similar to the discussion in the 90s when that time we were discussing whether we are going to be become members of political West and uh, of the transatlantic structures. But today's discussion is about whether we are going to s uh, remain and stay uh, stick to uh, the, our Western allies, and we will stay with them only formally, but also, or whether we are going to stay with them also mentally and with will. Uh, if there was any purpose in last week's discussion, then at least uh, it was that that we know where we are standing, what is happening, and what we need to do. The last surveys are really proving that. This was one of the arguments uh, that I actually went through with the representatives of the opposition. They were saying, OK, accept this. Slovaks uh, want it this way. Why are you not listening to the Slovak citizens? They don't want the uh, DCA. This should be the show or the display or demonstration of political accountability that uh, the kind of like um, very uh, accidental and emotional positions of the public should form and shape the security uh, and foreign policy of a given state. This is totally unacceptable. And when we were starting the um, debate on DCA, with Minister Nudge, we knew, had known what was happening. Uh, it, it, the discussion went far beyond to what we had expected before. Of course, uh, this uh, what we did reflected also uh, in our popularity and the results of the survey. But of course, you as a politician, you need to make decisions that nobody is going to applaud you for sometimes. And this is the really very important part of doing politics. And we need to go back to principal questions. We thought that some questions are off the table, that uh, you know we don't need to discuss uh, things, that there won't be any mobilization by populism and far right. We cannot shape our foreign, uh, foreign policy based on the trends on social media or depending on where you know the strongest voice uh, is coming from. And the, uh, another point was that uh, uh, you need to develop your foreign policy to all uh, directions, south, north, uh, west, east and west, but you always need to know where the north is. Uh, so the ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sten, this is uh, as an opening uh, reform, uh, sorry, remark. And if I were to say what is the biggest challenge of the Slovak foreign policy is then to really um, be strong and, and stay always uh, in good shape and, and really uh, win the war, so to say, at home and, and really win the, not only the battle. And it's very, very challenging to stand up to our um, di uh, ideals and our direction 
in this internal political context, uh, nothing is uh, kind of like respected, uh, neither historical facts nor the value of life and many other critical values. Uh, but we should be much more committed because of this. We should really focus on winning this, on upholding our values and democracy, and that's and until I am the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I will always uh, strive to secure those principal values. Thank you very much, Minister. I have to agree with you as a journalist. I can only confirm that there are few situations where foreign policy topics are at the front pages of the uh, daily media, but I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be happy about it because the topics communicated and the content are not encouraging. I'm talking about, obviously, about the situation the Russia-Ukrainian border where only yesterday everybody was discussing whether on the 16th of February there will be a Russian invasion to Ukraine, which was the information from the American Secret Service. But today there is another piece of news that one part of the Russian um, forces are withdrawing from the Ru Russia-Ukrainian border. So one of the questions is, do you uh, perceive this as the beginning of de-escalation of the tension? And uh, can we talk about the worst case scenario being um, out of question? Well, I don't want to avoid uh, you answer. The information has been out there for a couple of, couple of hours. So I will not comment any deeper at the moment, all the more that these you know, movements of forces at the Russian side of the border, movement of the military personnel, uh, we've met this, we witnessed them also in the previous days and weeks. You know, building of these military positions is not just a question of the end of uh, the last year, but basically already in spring, one year ago almost, we were confronted with a situation where there was difficult to explain why the Russian Federation is building these positions. And then there was this uh, movement of forces and personnel, but the hardware, the technology remained there. So to simplify this, there's nothing that I wish for more than we could deal and address this problem only and from behind the table. Basically, I don't see any other possibility than you know talking about it from behind the table. And any other, any move or any development that facilitates meaningful dialogue is appreciated. But it must be sustainable, and we must really be sure that this is heading towards towards you know um, mitigation or, or dispersion of any doubts that uh, the military operations still can be deployed. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, withdrew families of diplomats from Kiev. So I was uh, wondering when it's going to be, um, when the, the, the diplomats will be withdrawn. Um, the, well, okay, the f first thing is that all the f diplomats' families are thankfully at home. But, you know, it's a little bit of exaggeration of the whole situation. I mean, uh, their families are at home, uh, and I'm supposed to comment on the diplomats themselves. I won't speculate, but security of the diplomatic personnel and their families is alpha and omega. We are evaluating the situation every day, uh, what the situation is. At the moment, we are, we've are we evaluated the situation so that the family members and relatives are at home, and uh, we decided that we will stay in Kiev with our diplomatic staff. The security of this personnel as is, mm, is uh, given legitimate you know, grounds for our decision, but we can react quickly. We just don't want to do you know, fast steps. Or, you know, it's extremely important to keep our diplomats, to keep our diplomats there. You know? You know, I'm asking because this step is often a, a benchmark for security of the situation. Uh, when you know diplomats are being withdrawn, then the situation gets really serious. So that's why I wanted to know what is going to be this, you know, Rubicon when uh, 
you really believe this is so important that you need to withdraw the diplomats, diplomats to home. Well, when we evaluate the situation, this is necessary. We'll do that. That's all. Okay. When it comes to the uh, results or outcomes, you know, uh, of course, this is all hypothetical, uh, you know, because no one knows what's going to happen. Uh, even the people from the closest um, circle around uh, Vladimir Putin that no one actually can see into his head and that, that his uh, actions are unpredictable but especially the neighboring countries countries neighboring on Ukraine are preparing various contingency plans for various scenarios we in Slovakia have, um, believe or we've heard that the, the immediate result of uh, the invasion to Ukraine would be a huge migration wave. Hungary even already has specific uh, scenarios uh, which say about hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees coming to hung Hungary. Uh, do we have an idea what this would mean for Slovakia? Well, first of all, Security Council and other structures of the state, especially the Ministry of Interior, are doing everything they can to be ready for this scenario as well. But we need to openly say that everything depends on what security incident and what the scope of security incidents would materialize in Ukraine. That's the part of the scenarios, of course. But we do everything we can to manage this at home because, yes, migration moves it constitute one of the alternatives. We are in uh, touch with other countries. I will not name them because they turn to us to assist them in case of uh, need with passing of their diplomats or their citizens or, or their, their, um, their natives who are uh, located at the Ukrainian territory for the moment so that they could uh, take advantage of uh, moving to our territory from Ukraine in case of need. But I will not run away from this question, but I will not be the one, you know, spinning this uh, spiral of, of uh, escalation where people are scared, where people are concerned, they objectively are concerned that there's going to be a uh, hundred thousand of people coming into this country in a couple of days. We will do everything to manage this, but I want to talk about different things. I want to talk about the context. I want to talk about the efforts we invest to prevent this from happening. You know, I'm I'm not really happy about the you know you know mentioning any dates. I can't deal with it, and I won't actually somehow launch any activities, whether it's supposed to be 16th of February at three in the morning, or when or what. You know, until the very last moment, until it's possible, and I'm convinced there's a huge space for diplomatic solutions. So we need to do everything in our strength to avoid this from happening. Because you are asking correctly, what will be the what will be the results, the consequences for Europe? Well, fatal consequences. Because they have been fatal f since 2014, basically, because there's there was an unprecedented. Um, uh, break, uh, unprecedented interruption of the security, international security um, uh, infrastructure. What happened in 2008 in Georgia, 2014 in uh, Ukraine, but we can't have the map physically rewritten or the map of the essential principles of European uh, security. This is the essence that worries me as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, as a diplomat. Okay, so let's talk about the foreign policy. I was intrigued to hear Emmanuel Macron say, amongst other analytics, but he said it openly that mm, the whole the whole effort of the current Putin's policy is not really Ukraine, but rather ambitions of Russia to renew its old sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. So the geopolitical game, basically. Do you also agree with this perspective? I won't compare my perception with anybody else's perception, but the facts are, and this is quite obvious, that the Russian Federation doesn't accept security architecture as it is at the moment, or as it is operating at the moment, because the, one of the essential narratives that Russian parties are using is uh, that the West is 
breaching one of the essential principles which is uh, in the documents of OSCE, especially the Kastana and Istanbul declarations, and that's the undivisibility, undivisibility. Undi Undivisibility. Undivisibility of security. And uh, we are ready, on my, talking on my behalf, but I believe the West as such, is ready to talk to Russia for as long as necessary to listen to each other mutually, but expect our Russian partners to, you know, when they are talking about the undivisibility principles, the Istanbul Castagna principles, that they will not apply them in a selective manner. Because if you read these documents that talk about undivisibility of security, translated into human language, you can't do anything for the benefit of your security. Uh, they will be to the detriment of someone else's security. The Russian diplomats say that the NATO extension is to the detriment of their security. We say it is not. Also, these documents say that any country can choose freely military and security alliances for the guarantee of their security. Well, this is quite okay, but the other part of the same coin that the Russian Federation uses, that this cannot be to the detriment of territorial sovereignty and security and... and um, of, of a different country. You know, we had f terrible things happening in 2014 that w obviously are not going to go away. The Russian Federation regards Crim, Crimea for their own territory. For them, it's a closed issue. For us, it's not a closed issue because it was illegally. It was, this happened illegally. So, really, we had one essential problem of how to talk to the Russian Federation about these things so that they are willing to accept these essential principles. M that means free decision of any country, that NATO is not an aggressive organization. But Russian partners don't like to l hear that, but NATO is not an aggressive uh, attacking organization. It's a defense alliance. And unfortunately, the Russian Federation will have to deal with that, with this fact. So it's not us rejecting communication with the Russian Federation, we are talking with the Russian Federation under the threat of military action. And even these arguments that the Russian Federation is using, uh, you know, from OB, OB, OSCE, we could, we could say that, yeah, based on these arguments, there could be war, or maybe not war. But the responsibility of the international community as such including Russia, is to overcome this tension by respecting these principles. What do you think it's... Uh, what if, how do you think you can effectively and efficiently co uh, communicate and negotiate with Russians if their requirements are basically impossible to be met because their conditions would, meet, would mean that Russia, United States and NATO should agree on how the foreign policy and security architecture would look like of independent sovereign countries, not only Ukraine, but also Eastern members of NATO. How can you negotiate with such a partner? Uh, yes, this is one part of the truth that you are mentioning. And yes, it is a fact that these requirements, the Russian Federation to the alliance, this is just one third of the whole package that is being negotiated. Uh, well, here the space is really limited. There are things that are perhaps less spectacular from the political perspective, like renewal of essential cooperation, sorry, communication between Russia and NATO, because there's been full interruption of political line of communication. Uh, we need to s establish communication channels for, you know, the case of crisis uh, scenarios. And this was all interrupted because of this tension. We are not talking today. NATO expelled Russian diplomats uh, uh, from Brussels. The Russian Federation closed down the whole NATO representation in Mos Moscow. Mm, and, you know, much greater transparency when organizing military exercises would be really appreciated at the Russian Federation territory or our territory. Uh, but... Uh, uh -huh. But basically, they ask us to withdraw the Washington Agreement because this is what uh, 
is uh, was the, what they asked for in Article 10, to, to give up what is legally binding. So in this respect, it's very complicated. Uh, then there is a segment related to bilateral uh, uh, negotiations between Russia and the United States, very important, but it's not mentioned, it's the control of, of armaments, whether there's new uh, mm, arrangements for the, for the, uh, for some specific uh, missiles. Mm. I hope that in this sphere of military technologies, uh, because this was a bilateral agreement, now China is becoming a player. So this has much more complex character, this missile agreement. And then, of course, there are questions of large security architecture where I would really, really wish to see dialogue happening. That's the OSCE platform and all these principles. Uh, and we need to agree to, to interpret them in the same way, in the visibility of security, the transparency, etc., etc. You know, I'm not naive because the situation is really complicated, but we are very, very far from, uh, you know, putting bands on, on the table and taking, you know, machine guns into our hands. If we talked about the foreign policy theory level only, for a partner that, you know, presents their uh, ideas for negotiation, it's very important not to lose their face when the negotiations are over, especially if the partner is Russia. So, uh, can you imagine that Russia somehow, you know, when the situation gets calm uh, and there's no conflict and Russia doesn't receive the, the, the things from NATO that we're asking and then you just said they're absolutely acceptable. Can you imagine the situation happening? The dialogue needs to be maintained, needs to be alive. That's uh, so important because uh, we haven't talked uh, to each other for past two years because for two and a half years uh, we have been offering such a dialogue as alliance to, the, to Russia, but the truth is that the waters are really murky and uh, the atmosphere is really toxic, but this is due to the fact of the invasion of Russia to, or, or aggression of Russia t uh, towards uh, Ukraine. Some principles are not negotiable. That's uh, clear. Uh, NATO is not a threat. NATO has not uh, um, taken size of any area expansion is not against anybody. In 97, we uh, concluded an agreement with the Russia Federation and NATO about certain principles. That uh, agreement also anchors that inevitable infrastructure can be developed at the uh, arena of uh, member states. Uh, uh, and also, uh, NATO made a full, uh, clear declaration that there is no goal to, to position nuclear weapons or anything alike. But, uh, so, some things are unnegotiable. It needs goodwill. Uh, and we need to really leave this alternative or abandon, sorry, this uh, alternative that some things should be settled through war um, in 21st uh, uh, century, Ukraine has alluded to the fact that uh, its idea is flexible when it comes to the membership in the alliance. It sort of alluded that it is willing to give up on this ambition uh, under the threat of this immediate military conflict of, uh, with Russia. Could this be one of the solutions to this situation? The only solution is that we accept that Ukraine decides freely. Well, the question is whether this is a free decision, but I'm not going to comment on it. On it. it has been, uh, you know, corrected, uh, and, you know, there have been so many mm, comments. We need to eliminate this um, this idea that we are going to decide about the destiny of other states in 21st century. We are not dictating anything to Ukraine. We are not dictating anything to Belarus, Belarus. Um, this is a fake argument, as if NATO wanted to expand somewhere. Uh, some say that NATO should withdraw itself from eastern parts 
of Europe, as if NATO was occupying uh, those regions. But it's so difficult to get into NATO. You know what, uh, how much effort we needed to uh, develop when we missed the train in 97. Then um, it really took us five more years to get on the train. NATO keeps on saying, no, 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 you need, you need to do this and that, you need to transform your military forces, etc. This is not an expansion. This is expression of free will and recognition of the fact that small member states, as the Slovak Republic, want to have stronger guarantee of its own national defense than its own national defense. We want to have this uh, security, this, this warranty uh, uh, of s 30 more states. Uh, uh, you, in your introductory speech or words, you have touched upon the fact that as if we were mentally going back to 90s uh, when we were deciding where to belong uh, from the geopolitical and uh, uh, foreign uh, perspective. Uh, so you said that, yes, we are doing this. Uh, yes, it has to do with high level of polarization of the Slovak society that can be seen also in the public opinion survey that sh clearly shows that uh, the vast majority of public uh, really is uh, misled and uh, they draw on um, or they tap into conspiracy sources. And I would like to ask the questions from Slido that uh, have to do with the polarization of Slovakia. Minister, are you afraid? when it comes to the direction of Slovakia in foreign policy, if opposition gets to the uh, government. Uh, I, am, I am not afraid of the opposition. You know, it disnudes itself in front of the whole nation. Then not, uh, there's not only a handful of us that we speak loudly and that we are criticized for speaking up, but there are many people in this society that are silent, that don't need to shout, that don't need to make scenes, they don't need to uh, howl a siren during the negotiations of the parliament. So the fact that the opposition now organized this very disgusting uh, theater with the defense of Slovakia. Just don't, don't tap into it, really. I'm not afraid of the opposition. What I'm much more afraid of, and it has been, it has become more and more clear and evident, uh, and we can see it also in the public opinion surveys uh, that, uh, you know, this is not an immediate fact. For many years, we have been just looking and observing that the long-term opinion surveys uh, keep on resulting uh, in finding that Slovakia would do better if it were neutral. So we uh, even the opposition really says incredible things that can be interpreted in so many ways that s s sort of like, okay, you are doing favor, uh, we are doing favor to you, uh, or you are doing favor to us, uh, and we will tell you when you can help us. This is the way we uh, uh, talk with the Baltic states, with the Polish. This is the underlying tone of this uh, very brutal discussion that has just uh, surfaced the long-term prevailing uh, things. We sort of throw ourselves, we kind of like surrendered ourselves to the populace for many years, uh, teams of experts uh, that make incredible money on political advising that, uh, okay, you shouldn't be talking about NATO, you shouldn't be talking about the US, you, you never should utter the fact that we are members of NATO and you never shall uh, talk about the fact that the US is a strategic par partner. So we let uh, the, those advisors talk. 
and we are totally cornered and then we happen to end up in this situation and as, as if a bucket of uh, blood uh, was poured into the ocean and the sharks are just circling around in spite of the fact we cannot let them corner us. This is absolutely impossible, unthinkable. The, this diplomacy that has a very strong and deep uh, uh, relation to this country, we cannot uh, break our necks on this. But why we have ended up uh, in this point, why we should take stand where to go? Uh, what I really like now, uh, the one who doesn't know whom to follow is able to follow anybody. Aren't we at this very point? Isn't this also a result of uh, the of word of uh, of this uh, coalition? Because not a single member has more uh, support and is not uh, trustworthy, not uh, at the level of 50 percent either. Uh, I'm. I'm not criticizing the opposition for criticizing us. We have lost a major part of the public trust. I'm not going to challenge this because we are making many mistakes. It's great that you are asking. Yes, let's be clear on that. The only criticism I have is that in the legitimate deployment of opposition against the government, because this, this is their job, they need to fight, they need to show that they are a better alternative. This is uh, totally normal in democracy, but what my criticism focuses on is that totally ruthlessly they picked up something what cannot be the subject of political struggle, and this is the, the foreign policy direction and defense and safety, and they have risen Arisen the wave that doesn't need to be controlled, and this is what the public opinion surveys show. I don't want to make this, uh, allusions to other uh, developments like in the Great Britain. This is uh, yes, this is something similar. Many were criti had been criticizing uh, had been criticizing the European Union for so long, and then they asked the. Uh, Vox Populi, and they got the answer. Uh, it's uh, I, uh, they should the opposition shouldn't be blamed for criticizing us what we do in this public health or economic etc. That's okay, but this is totally unthinkable. Okay, um, fake news, disinformation campaigns, uh, they go in hand go hand in hand and now the question why the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not stricter when it comes to the fight against disinformation. I do believe that we do act strictly. I am not convinced that I'm not convinced that uh, w what can be done or that we can resolve the question of disinformation or mistruth and, and fake news with sophisticated campaign and technologies. Maybe it uh, should be done. Maybe I'm too old for it. I don't believe in shortcuts that we will set certain algorithm, of course I exaggerate here, or that we start to flood the public uh, space with uh, advertising and ads, etc., and this will fix the problem. No. I believe that we need to have clear political positions, attitudes, what I can, you know, I could mobilize and I could uh, spend millions on a campaign and we could pretend that we have done something, but this is not going to be as easy. If we are not going to manage very basic discussions, f such as uh, around the DCA, if we are not going to stand up uh, with our um, allies, then w w what is uh, this political West we are talking. Uh, talk to a Slovak living in northern Slovakia about political West. This is com 
completely alien uh, narrative uh, to those people. How to make people understand what is the rule of law? Uh, rule of law is a question of uh, uh, bread winning without the rule of law. You, we won't have investments, we won't have jobs, judiciary, etc. This is the question of survival. The rule of law is question of survival. And you cannot catch up uh, through a campaign. You really need to fight for it. Uh, we need to be very thorough and consistent. Sometimes we lose political points uh, because we stood up for a topic that is very uh, important for Slovakia. Okay, how to structure the communication? It's not fair because the government and the civil society and the media, they stand uh, on the position that uh, presents facts. But on the other side, there's fake news, uh, lies, and emotions. Uh, the other side works with the emotions, uh, at least, okay? And it's psychologically evident and proven that you are not going to win over the emotions through, uh, emotions through hard facts. So if we want to move further, how to manage the situation, how to sort of win over and how to defeat those emotions, well, since I'm the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that I have answer to everything. So, no, I don't have answer to this. I believe it's a chimera. If we set our objectives so that in this complicated area like security <coughs> and foreign affairs, we will be able to convince with facts and arguments those who are spreading emotions, well, we just tried it. We've just tried it. I mean, we lost the public debate. But despite the fact, I believe it's a victory because we faced the whole thing responsibly. Now, sometimes losing in public debate, losing towards, a, losing to an emotional narrative, narration is not a is not a defeat for the for the state for the government. You know, 30 years, pretty much almost 30 years. After the founding of this republic, the point is that we shouldn't get carried away by shouting and noise just because the emotion is well much easier to spread. Well, I can't uh, succeed in argumentation if, if, if an MP tells you, quote, that based on the setting of the Slovak-American uh, Defense Cooperation Agreement, the the setting of uh, jurisdiction is that Slovak soldiers will be raping Slovak young girls, quoting, um, and the Americans will take these uh, rapists away and they will transport them to America, end quote. And I say, Article 12, uh, Section C says, etc., etc., you know. And the point is that we can't, you know, we can't get scared. Well, yeah, okay, you've got the emotion, you've got the emotion, but we've got something that is good for the country and important for the country. And the last argument, what drives us? What drives us to deal with it in this way? If, you know, there's Professor Stern, he's an excellent German speaker, as good as I am. You know what is Nacht und Nacht und is is reading from someone's lips. You reading, you, you, you saying things as you are reading someone else's lips. You know, if Helmut Kohl was dealing like, uh, dealing with this uh, through, uh, dealing with um, imp uh, implementation of Euro in 1999, there's no Euro today because the Deutschmark for the Germans was an absolute embodiment of post-war prosperity and wealth. They were against the shared currency. But Helmut Kohl, I, I remember this, I was just a, a, a junior diplomat. He was not afraid, he didn't give up in this public discourse. Of course, the discourse was much more cultivated compared to the situation here in, uh, a couple of days ago. But today we have Euro and he didn't give up. And I remember that some historians, if in 19... 1918, there was a referendum in Slovakia. We would be still living in Hungary today. So there are a number of parallels. The Brexit, Brexit is the same thing. You know, this is just an example of what emotions can cause. You know, 
the result of the referendum in, in the UK was just pure emotions, no rational arguments. So we are returning again to what you're saying, that we lost to emotions, but we actually won the, the, the battle because... The, but, you know, there can be a referendum also in this emotionally charged atmosphere, and we suddenly we find out that we are out. So, uh, do you have any idea that, um, you know, of communication, you know? I mean, I, I agree, I have just so many questions and no answers, and I'm pulling the answers from you, so I'm sorry for that, but is there any way how to change the communication strategy or overall strategy, you know, across the board in the state? Uh, uh, authorities and state of offices. I know, I know where you are pushing me, and okay, I understand. Yeah, we all keep hearing this. That if you want to sell something, you need to have a communication strategy. But then you arrive from Brussels, and you need to communicate what you're doing in Brussels. And instead of saying that I'm doing this, and we shouldn't have this, if we were in the EU members. We, we wouldn't have roaming, we wouldn't have so many other things. Then you, you know, forget about that. And I'm asking, how will a clever communication strategy replace uh, clear political statements? And we have changed to do that every day. I mean, I, I, I believe we've been doing communication strategy for a good hour. I don't know how many people are watching this, but if online, but if there are at least as many people online as in this room, this is the way, this is a communication strategy, this is the way how to explain to people in context, I believe the pandemic's, uh, pandemic is over, at least this spring, and maybe we'll be able to travel around Slovakia, you know, Martin is doing, Ingrid is doing, she travels around the regions and around the world, Martin Klaus is doing this uh, with the conference on the future of Europe, so we need to do more of this, but nothing will happen, even if we crisscross Slovakia three times, the result won't be fast, you know, politics must not confuse people, that's irresponsible, confusing people. Okay, let's move on a little from communication, communication strategy, if we may, we have five minutes, okay, we have five minutes to go. I would also ask, but, so let me use the question from Slido, because this is an interesting topic, the question is, the change global security situation is intensifying European debate on kick-starting the common uh, foreign and defense strategy or policy of Europe. We've been talking about it for years and years. There hasn't been political will. We are, you know, I know this is a topic for a standalone conference, but, well, one of the members of the audience is asking, and I'd like to ask too, What's the chance that in the near future we could advance to having um, a single European um, foreign uh, policy and security policy w using qualified majority? Well, this has become a hit. This has become a buzzword, you know, having QMV in um, common shared, co co common uh, foreign policy and defense policy, you know, because today. Mm, also because it's consensus, the foreign policy positions of the European Un uh, Union are adopted as the lowest common denominator, you know, it's been, it's polishing for so many years, every single uh, comma and, uh, and full stop, so that everyone can live with it, but at the end of the day, the value is so low that no one actually takes care, no one actually, no one cares, uh, so the consensus is pushing us so low that you're reading a piece of paper you don't even know what is written on that paper and it's an official statement of the European Union not even you well yeah I do but it doesn't really make it's not worth it but if someone believes that we will change the content just like that when it's QNV so qualified majority and this is going to be uh, quite complicated when it's QNV yeah, qualified majority voting. Th those who were voted over, they said, oh, it's not, it's not behind, I'm not behind that, you know. So the topic will be what? Well, the EU has a position, but th there's a number of countries that are not behind that position, you know. It doesn't solve anything, or, well, doesn't solve everything. So the question is whether we're going to be more efficient with QMV or not.
So you know what I think? Even without QMV, I think the high representative for the uh, single uh, foreign uh, and uh, defense policy of the Euro Euro European uh, Union, that is Joseph Borrell, so that even without QMV, we give him much more space to talk on our behalf, in our name, and maybe talking just like it is now. You know, he's a poor guy. They are watching his lips. What word he will use, we have to write every single word for him and agree you know, I have so much trust in Europeness of you know, foreign service of the EU, also in high representative Mr. Borrell. So I can imagine that he would really have a much free space to talk on his own. You know, let me give you an example. Uh, after the advance of the new American administration, it has become not an exception but a rule that we have uh, shared negotiations with with. Tony Blinken, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the, we, this hasn't been for years that the American mm, Secretary of State was meeting with uh, the, the European Union foreign ministers. But I was, I am quite irritated that the debate with Mr. Blinken is not a debate of the EU and its standpoint, but it's a debate of 27 foreign ministers where every single one of us is talking to Tony Blinken. Um, the last uh, recently, I just suggested uh, unsuccessfully. I said I give up word. I give up my word because if we need, we can talk to Tony Blinken alone. I mean, two weeks ago, I, I went to the United States to talk to him, but, and I said, let's give up that word. Let's have one person, Joseph Borrell, talking on our behalf, on behalf of the whole 20 EU 27, because still there is this instinct from the 19th century, and the, or maybe the first half of the 20th century, like this is really. Uh, question of national interest, where we need to have, you know, sovereignty. Uh, you know, we were able to give up our sovereignty in a hundred times more sensitive areas within the scope of EU. Now, we had shared currency. You know, ca countries gave up their monetary policy. We don't decide about interest rates. We We are part of one whole where even the banking uh, supervision in macroeconomics is in Brussels, right, or, or ECB. You know, we have QMV across the whole internal market. But when it comes to accepting council conclusions in the field of, uh, I don't know, human rights uh, or anything, then we are in the 20th century again. Well, I'm afraid that it's, again, about the emotions, because foreign policy in uh, large countries like France, or uh, as Britain used to be, or Spain, or, or even Greece, not such a large country, is linked to um, very many emotions and old wounds and old barriers and old emotions that is very difficult to overcome. But if we, if we come to terms with it, well, we, we will not come to terms with it, but then we only would support those who say that the whole EU should be only limited to a single market concept and economic cooperation and we shouldn't have the ambition of any other higher community form because just beyond us because the member states cannot give up their rights. Well, if, the, if we didn't give up uh, our sovereignty, we wouldn't have anything in the EU. People don't realize that political integration is not about someone declaring that Slovakia is not a sovereign country anymore. That's not political integration. You know what political integration is? That's Schengen. That's political integration because without political decision, listen well, you don't realize, or we don't realize, giving up the control at the national borders. That's Schengen. Schengen didn't eliminate borders. It eliminated control at the border. So what is greater... Uh, what is greater demonstration of sovereignty of any country is controlling its borders, and we gave it up. Roaming, you know, I mean, some somehow you won't say that it damaged our sovereignty. That thanks, you know, having this huge leverage from internal market, we managed to force large telecom players, huge players, we forced them to give up these huge profits from roaming fees. Do you imagine that? That's why I, I really like this topic, but this is what we negotiated in 2016. This is not explained. This is not broken down in detail. You know, today we have 
uh, we have people, you know, shouting and screaming about state sovereignty. State, s state sovereignty is not something that you declare, but it's about being able to operate and defend the interests of your country in the globalized world. Well, let's declare that we're a sovereign country, you know. In a situation like that, the whole EU in 2050 will have 4% of global population and 11% GDP. So let's, let's say we're sovereign. We will have 0 0.00 something, you know. This is the question of protection of our sovereignty, how we can operate in global world for the benefit of this country. Let me, uh, let me conclude this uh, evaluation, the review conference, by returning to the Minister Eduard Kukan. And when I personally learned about this very sad news about him passing away, not only many personal things came to my mind, but uh, also I s had this thought that I do hope that uh, together with him we are not losing the geopolitical direction of Slovakia. No, definitely our geopolitical direction is not dying or has not died with him. In, spi uh, in spite of the fact that we need to improve governance, we are in midterm, and I totally agree with you that uh, the disillusion of last week, the disillusion in the society was enhanced by the fact that we are not governing by the best possible way. We have lost so much trust, so much hope that was vested in the, gov uh, in the, the, in the elections. But the consensus, uh, boring and political consensus, collapsed because the opposition challenged and attacked the core pillars of our foreign and political orientation. It's not about a one-off thing, a kind of a single case. I do recall this. And I'm not going to overplay it here, but a great part of our opposition said that this is this was totally um, totally irrelevant for them because for them this means um, mobilization of internal forces and this is totally irresponsible we really need to remind ourselves where the north is where to go what the direction is so thank you very much for your last words for concluding the uh, the review conference and I would like to wish you all the best uh, to everybody here in the hall but and also to those who are following us online thank you very much